That's right. Here we go. Once again, it's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Hello to everyone. This is episode 305. Amazing but true. That's right. Good to see everybody. Um, I'm excited. I got a good feeling about today's show. So yeah, good, good to see everybody out there. Switzerland in the house. You know, a lot of our old friends. Norway in the house. Good, good. Yes, a little 930 footage there to kick it off. So yeah, good to see everybody. Lori Dawn, how are you? Jeff Kaplan, yeah, it's happening. It's, it's going, it's going down. Looking forward to it. I hope everybody's well. I hope you have told your loved ones that you love them. This is important in this life. That said, uh, I apologize if it's a little noisy. Uh, strangely enough, with today's guest on the show, the the president is in my neighborhood. And it's causing quite a stir. So the traffic's backed up on my street and, uh, and all that, you know. So, <laughs> so, so there you go. Is that right? You're hyped for this one. Good. I'm hyped for this one too. Hey. Hey, Tim. Nice to see you. So good. The gang's, did he get lost? Yeah, he ended up, I don't know, this guy, this president's in my neighborhood. He just wandered through here, you know. So here we go. Let, let's let's get it on. Let, let's let's get down to brass tacks today. Um, it's going to be a good one. Uh, let's bring on our friend uh, since the beginning, the hardcore shutterbug Stephen Messina. What's happening? What's up? Buddy? What's up? Since good day one. one. Good yeah. one. Since day one. Yeah, I, I like I am. You know, like why is this man smiling? Like, I'm super excited about today. So yeah, absolutely. You know, this is this is going to be a great one, and. Um, I just, uh, you know, so I got, that's what I got to say. How's things in the, uh, in the supply shed? In the box is good. In the box is good. It's cold, but it keeps me fresh. Yeah. It's it seals in, seals in the freshness. <laughs> yeah. See, it seals in the pain. That said, yeah. that said, let's, uh, let's clear the deck. Let's, uh, let's do photo of the day. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, let me clear, let me clear the way. Here we go. Wrong answers only, please. <laughs> In keeping with the tradition of keeping traditions. Wrong answers only, please. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, this is photo of the day. Boom. Wrong answers only, please. Here we go. Is it? Is it? What is it? Let's see. What do we got here? Let's see. Is it? Is it the serial poets? Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is it Jerry Seinfeld? <laughs> Another guy I see in my neighborhood. Is it Scott Weiland? Close. Is it? Is it? Is it a iguana? Is it? Ant, is it Anthony Kiedis? It is an iguana, actually. Is it Lou? Is it Lou Reed? Is it Drew Stone? Before the haircut. Yeah. I haven't had hair like that in a long time. Is it Jennifer? Is it Jennifer Aniston's spread for, for Playboy? Ouch, Whitney. <laughs> is it Mackenzie Phillips? <laughs> Jeez. Good one. You know, you know, I like this one. Is it Ed Koch? This man should have been mayor. Listen, I grew up in New York. You know, Ed Koch is a big part of growing up here in the city. Oh, yeah. All right. Is it Jimmy Buffett? Is it Steve Bader's? Is it Frankenstein Monster? All right, what 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 do we got here? Well, we are looking. Oh, you at know what? You know what? Let me let, let's let's do this. Let's put another right. shot on. Right answers only, please. Uh, here's a little. Let's have some right answers only, please. Here we go. Boom. Who is who is this masked man? Is it? Is it the is it the Jesus of Detroit? Yeah, absolutely. Is it Iggy Pop? Is it Iggy? Is Extra it, points for the guitar player. Is it Iggy? Is it Iggy? Is it Iggy? Is it the one and only Iggy Pop? Okay. What do we got here? This is, of course, this is the one and only Jesus of Detroit. This is Iggy Pop. Um, former member of the Iguanas, actually. Huh? This is going this is going back a ways to uh September of 1988, 
uh, at a, at a place on Long Island called Showcase, which was used to be called Lemoore Far East, and it became Showcase. And it's right at a little shopping center right by my house. And uh, the the awesome thing, this was uh, he was touring an album called Instinct. I, I like I like how it says on the ticket Mayfair Shopping Center. <laughs> yeah, that's the place. That is the place. And uh, right. and what I thought was was extra special about this particular album and tour is Steve Jones was his guitarist on the album. Mm. But for the tour, the gentleman you saw in that photo is a guy named Andy McCoy, who is from a uh, a great Scandinavian band called Hanoi Rocks, which uh, Michael Monroe was the front man of. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, here he is. Here he is. Yeah, there he is. And uh, this was, uh, I mean, um, this was also the first time I ever saw Iggy. And, you know, it was in this t this little club and we were like right on right up on front of the stage. And and he was amazing. And it was I mean, I've seen him a bunch ever since then. But this is the show that I measured all the other shows to. And uh, I've never seen him play. You never saw Iggy. Never saw Iggy Pop play. Well, well, considering he's immortal, you'll have plenty of chances. Right. Right. Considering <laughs> you know. he's gonna be, considering he's gonna out, outlive us all. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Have, here's one last shot from your roll of film. Here he is. Yeah. yeah. This was this was such a great show, and uh, and his band. He always had. You know, the only thing with Iggy is, as much as he always had great live bands, his albums never had the same spark as his live bands. Mm. In my opinion, you know, like the albums were great, but when you see him live, it's like a whole other animal. I will make that happen one of these days. You got to do it. Well, thanks, okay. man. Well, thank you. And uh, I always love how you uh, you're paid to come on my show. So you know what? <laughs> I'm here, and and if and if you need, seems like you know, seems like a quiet day at the train yard. Yeah, you know, no interruptions today. No banging on the door. But uh, that's because right. I threatened everyone's life about today. So, yeah, yeah. All right, let's get it on. Let's bring our guest. Yeah, on, let's man. do this. I got to get my front row seat here. I'll talk to you in a bit. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, Stephen Messina in the Hardcore Shutterbug. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, often imitated, never duplicated. I uh, hope everybody's okay. And in, 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 I see everybody from around the world. Good. No. Uh, no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Interlopers? <laughs> Interlopers are welcome. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's bring on, oh, Poland in the house. Good. My Polish brothers. Here we go. Today's guest is an American musician, producer, and record label co-founder, Halen, from the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. As a musician, he's known for his work with the bands Teen Idols, Embrace, Egg Hunt, Scooball, Grand Union, Palehead, The Evens, Corky, and of course, Fagazi and Minor Threat. Please welcome, coming as from the Discord House in Washington, D.C., Mr. Ian Mackay. <laughs> Greetings. Hi, buddy. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How's things in the nation's capital? All good. Beautiful day. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I was thinking about look. I was watching that thing about Iggy, and I didn't see Iggy until the early two thousands. Actually, I may have seen him once in the late eighties, but I saw him in the early two thousands when the Stooges got back together. Mm. And I was really struck by a couple of things. <clears throat> One thing about the Stooges specifically is that the the kind of weird loping sound, that kind of strut of their music, mm. had a lot to do with the drummer. Scott Ashton, he right. had a really interesting kind of lazy beat that, and it, and it, and it really um, confirmed a, a theory that uh, Brian Canty Fugazi once said to me, he said, the drummer, he said that every great, like really great rock band has a drummer with real personality. That's what really sets, that's what's made. And you think about it, you start thinking about it, like it's true. Like, you know, the drummers really, they really create the personality. Now, at some point that drummer may leave and the songs have taken their own life at that point. But you, you mean like really you mean like a like a topper hedon thing? Sure. Or, yeah. You, but you if know, you think I mean, about to Ringo or Charlie Watts or Keith Moon or or Robo, Black Flag, or, Ch or Chuck Biscuits, like everyone, these guys were really specific kind Steven, of drummers. Steven, Steven Adler. Right. Another, yeah. 
Absolutely. I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. You know, a, 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 a drummer really, really sort of uh, sets sets the tone, you know. Indeed, yeah. A absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, let's bounce the ball back and forth a little bit, uh, you and me. How did you come up? Did you grow up in a musical household? How, how did music come into your life? Uh, I couldn't actually, I don't know. Music has always been in my life. Um, I started playing piano before I can remember. Like mm -hmm. I just was, I was playing little songs by the time I think I was three or four or five years old. I didn't, um, I just don't have any recollection of starting. Uh, but my parents were not really musicians. My mother could, she could read the piano. She read, she could play music if she could read it. Mm -hmm. And my father didn't really, he didn't play music um, at all, but I was obsessed with it. And, mm -hmm. um, and I loved listening to the piano. Um, and then there was, you, you took, you took piano lessons as a child? Not until I was older. I took, mm -hmm. started piano, took piano lessons at first, probably when I was about eight years old, my mom sent me to a woman who lived up the street from us on Beecher street. Right. And, um, she taught me the keyboard. Like I already had written songs at this point, like weird. Didn't, wow. And to be clear, they're very simple song, very fundamental, but they were organized sound. They were mm -hmm. things that I could re replicate over and over. Um, so she taught me the, basically the keyboard and maybe we started looking at some of the, like the primers, like the, for people who played piano, the red books, you would remember the red book sure. piano books. Sure. Um, and then my mother, after a year of that or so, my mother said, well, maybe we should, you should go to an, um, a more proper um, like teacher. So I went to American University here in Washington that has had a school, um, they had a you know, professor, this guy, Professor Kidd, he was a nice guy. Um, but he, I went up to that, the, you know, I had to audition in. And I remember going into this little recital room with him and I played him. I had written probably, I don't know, 10, 20 little pieces of music at that point. And I played him some of my music. And then he said, that's nice. He said, it's, not it's not piano, but it's nice. And I was, you know, I was probably 11 at the time. And I remember thinking like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Like, what does that mean? It's not piano. Um, and I realized that what he was talking about was a, was a, this sort of formal concept of piano, you know, is what I referred to as, you know, piano with a capital P. Right. And mm -hmm. I 100% played piano with a lower case P you know, like mm -hmm. I, for me, it was just, I just played piano and, um, and I took his, I took his class, his lessons for a while. Um, and he was critical of the way I sat and the way I played. Um, I, again, I liked him, but I did not like the lessons and I quit. Um, I did not, I just was not, it was, I felt like I was being sort of forced to conform into some other, somebody else's idea of what, what creativity was and fuck that. So, um, so I quit and stopped playing piano for about, I'd say two years I stopped. And then when I sufficiently had forgotten whatever it was that, that was being impressed upon me, um, I returned to the piano and I, to this day, will still can just sit at a piano and play it. Did you, uh, did you walk away with retaining some of the, some of the basics, some of the fundamentals? I, I mean, no, I don't no, think I did. Right. I think yeah. I already, I had my basics and fundamentals. Did, that's yeah. what I was interested in the kind of piano I wanted to play, not with sure. the kind of piano that I was being taught. And right. again, I, I want to underscore that guy. He's a great guy, professor kid. He was a good dude. I don't right. mean I'm not, there's no slight. It just literally, right. it's, it's a, it was a, um, a framing that I did just I just disagreed with, and I and I just couldn't be a part of it. Um, now at the same time, I of course had become obsessed with rock and roll. Um, I love the Beatles, I love the Rolling Stones. I was obsessed with Janis Joplin. Mm. Um, uh, uh, I was you know I, Queen. Which, Queen later. That was the first band I ever saw actually, um, mm. but uh, uh, or first big band I ever saw. Um, mm. But the and then you know Jim, Jimi Hendrix was enormous and remains enormous with me. Hendrix was you, huge. Absolutely, one. you and so me I both. was really obsessed with. Um, this is late sixties, early seventies. I was really obsessed with um, rock and roll, and I remember still remember hearing um, the Jimi Hendrix Smash Hits album and hearing Hey Joe for the first time and being mm -hmm. really um, just so excited. 
Hey, look, Amani, did, you, did, I, did you have did you have brothers or sisters? Like, how how did this stuff come across the radar screen? I know we talked about we talk a lot about the show, and you and I are the same age. That FM radio was so vibrant back then. I don't think I was hearing FM radio because we just mm -hmm. had a car with an AM radio, so I knew all the radio hits th that mm -hmm. time. And my older sister had some records for sure, though I I really credit my exposure there was a house <clears throat> about four doors up from us it was a bunch of what i thought of as hippie kids um mm. they had a group house they were students um i sort of thought it was sort of a commune they had like suns painted on the wall and <laughs> and i really and they were kind of radical seemed radical to me and i remember that they all had their own like records and i would just go look through their records and <clears throat> they would have I remember seeing the uh, James Gang uh, record. It's called. What's it called? Um, Rides again. <clears throat> yeah, rides again with the, on the we have on the motorcycles and great record. <laughs> God and I love that record. <laughs> just, yeah, but just study at the time. I didn't even get to hear the record. I just studied the covers and then right. uh, vol, uh, Jefferson Airplane Volunteers, and those records were so haunting. Just looking at them. And uh, I remember this one woman had a milk crate or something like a milk crate and she had, it It was filled with records, which is probably, I don't know, 30 records or something. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, someday, maybe I'll have that many records. You know, it was like, so I was so blown away by it. And at my house, we had just seven inches mostly. Right. And I listened to some records I've listened to over and over and over um, <clears throat> specifically one by, uh, Ramsey Lewis, not Ramsey Lewis. Um, God damn it. I got to get uh, McCoy Tyner. What's that? McCoy no, Tyner. No, no, it's not a, no, no. It's a more of a um, country guy. Country. Um, I was getting confused with Ramsey Lewis trio, but it's not. It's, right. um, it's a song by um, the song is called Last Date or Last da Last Date. Somebody hmm. can somebody will remember what it is. It'll come back to me in a second. But, is, is, it, is it jazz? It's country jazz, yeah, sort of country okay. jazz. Last date, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll come. It'll give it a second. It, someone will post yeah. it in the chat room. That name will show up. I mean, because yeah, yeah. somebody. It's funny. I always Ramsey Lewis and this guy's name. I always get the two um, confused. But anyway, um, I became then obsessed with Woodstock and the Who, and um, and the Monterey Pop, and this seeing all the guitars getting smashed. I just thought it was, I just thought, oh, this is, I also thought rock and roll was really was, it was the sound of revolution for me. You know, it was the sound. I felt like that it represented the counterculture. It was the world in which um, the uh, society was going to be changed for the good because, uh, you know, at that time, if you're my age, you would remember that, you know, obviously civil rights stuff was insane and, and of course, women's Floyd rights. Kramer? Is it Floyd? Uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Floyd. Uh, yeah, Floyd, Floyd Kramer. Exactly. Thank, yeah. you. thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. And um, but the uh, uh, you know, civil rights was <clears throat> was really hot, and um, women's lib was cooking, and <laughs> gay rights was burgeoning, and of course, the war was you know the Vietnam War was raging, and the and the and the peace movement was just so. Um, it was just so full on. And, and, you like, were, and you were in DC. Yeah. So I was, yeah. And my parents were, they weren't, they were left kind of people, left, you know, lefty kind of people, but we were very, we were a member of a church called St. Stephen's and Incarnation. It's an Episcopal church, mm -hmm. but it was a church that practiced a sort of a liberation theology and was really involved with all of these issues. So like when I was growing up, there was, you know, they were involved with all sorts of civil rights marches. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, mm -hmm. the church, we were quite near 14th Street where a lot of the rioting was happening. And we uh, marched down to 14th Street and we held a service on 14th Street in amidst sort of the, the you know, literally the smoldering buildings. And I'm not exaggerating. I actually saw photos sure. of this and I was like, wow. Like, so I was six years old at the time. And um, so I was really involved with an activist kind of world. Now, ironically, you know, the, the part of the church, it was interesting. The least interesting to me was 
the, the religion. Um, right. But, and I st I wasn't a member. I didn't, you know, I, I stopped going to that church in 74 and I'm certainly not, but I'm still, that church still does punk shows to this day. They're still, oh, wow. St. Stephen's is, you know, still really, they still do work. They're really it's still a radical place. Um, was, and, was, was, was your dad um, in the, mo in, in J uh, John F. Kennedy's motorcade? He was. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He was, my father was a journalist and he worked uh, for a wire service um, that was reporting to the Houston Chronicle and he got a job in the White House press corps and his very first trip of the White House was to Dallas. Oh my. Yeah. So he was in the oh. motorcade. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I would assume just having that in the household, having, uh, you know, your dad that was actually, you know, there, uh, that, that's heavy. You know, I didn't really know it until many years later. He didn't mention it. Oh, really? It was one of no. those deals, huh? No, he was, but it wasn't, it was more like he was a, um, there was other stuff going on. I mean, there was, uh, that was distant history for us. Like there was, see, yeah. you know, the, you know, the anti-war movement was so full on and there was just a lot you know, 70s were crazy. And uh, so I thought rock and roll really was, Rock and roll is really the the soundtrack for all of this. Um, what I would consider like the good thinking, like, you know, countercultural pushing back against mainstream society, mainstream society is so responsible for all so much ugliness. Yeah. Fuck mainstream society. Let's, let's, let's create a new world. And um, so then I really thought, well, I'm going to be in a band. I want to get involved. I want to have be in a rock band, but I couldn't figure out how to play guitar at all. And then right. the more I studied, I realized that I was so, it was just rem so removed, like Led Zeppelin or Aeros, all those kind of bands. I just couldn't get my mind around how guitars worked, how you or how bands worked. I nobody in my family was a musician, really. There was no, I didn't have any models. I didn't know. There was, there was no roadmap. No, and I'm from Washington D.C., so you know, what do I? There was nothing that I knew about at all sure, in sure. terms of, um, and uh, so I kind of gave just gave up on the idea of being in a band and playing guitar. I mean, really, my guitar, I bought a guitar from a garage sale for like $10. It was hopelessly warped. It was electric <laughs> guitar, um, right. but it was a mess. And my mother, um, she hired a local kind of tough guy, a bully. Um, not, I don't mean a bad way, but he was, he was a tough guy. He's Nicky Bazanka. And, uh, Baz Bazante? Uh, yeah, Bazanka. Bazanka. Um, yeah, okay. he was, I mean, he was a older kid and tough and my mom hired him to teach me how to play guitar he could play guitar and i think her idea was if if he was to um teach me even if i didn't learn he'd learn my name and i wouldn't have any problems with him and it turned out to be true i ended up being friends with nikki until he died really and and i still friends with his sisters um but uh uh but I couldn't figure it out. I could play smoke on the water on one string. That was about it. That's all I could, that's all I could figure out. It's and a start. Um, yeah, it was a start. So then um, I gave up on music and I just became a skateboarder. I was going to ask you, I know skateboarding comes into, into your orbit here and, and um, you went to Wilson high school, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how does that tie in skateboarding, Wilson high school, teenager? Well, I was skating long before I was skating long before I went to Wilson. I started skating, mm -hmm. When I was at Gordon Junior High School, I mean, it first started, we were, you know, we were um, in my neighborhood. I grew up in Glover Park here. And when we started out, we were all riding BMX bikes or pro pre BMX. We used to take uh, Schwinn Stingrays and just we'd strip off the fenders and take off the banana seats, put on 10 speed seats, and the just Raleigh strip. chopper. Yeah, well, yeah, we well, we were Stingray guys, and uh, <laughs> but then we would just make these hybrid like BMX bikes, and then we'd just go in the woods and just make jumps and try to do. We'd see, do you ever see this movie called On Any Sunday? Yes, of course. Yeah, so that movie was huge for us, and we were all so all we wanted to do was build jumps and go riding on the ice and putting it. We tried putting nails. There's a scene in that movie for those of you who don't know. On Any Sunday was a movie about motorcycle motorcycle racing really and or motorcycle culture steve and mcqueen steve mcqueen i believe was involved he's in it he's in it yeah I he's think he was producer. Like an executive producer or he something. probably yeah. is yeah. yeah it's yeah. kind of an incredible i yeah. saw it not like that long ago and i still loved it but is that right yeah there's one scene in the movie where there's these um i think they're canadian ice track racers they race on a oval of ice like they're racing and yeah. 
and they put these nails in their tires sure. for grip, you know? Sure. And so, but of course, if you're riding on ice, you're going to slip and fall. So when you fall on an ice track and there's guys coming up behind you <laughs> with nails in their tires, you're it trying doesn't to bode well. <laughs> trying to get the fuck off that track. Right. And so, um, so they, uh, <laughs> but because we were so inspired by um um hold on someone's writing any given sundays of that's a that's a football movie i'm talking about on any sunday on somebody any sunday. wrote that yeah um mm -hmm. but uh um so we took our tires and we put nails in our tires to try to ride in the snow or on the ice but we didn't you know so we went we went on the first moment we started to ride it, you know, the nails just popped all of our inner tubes because it was an absurd concept. But um, so we did that. And then, but then BMX, we started riding in the woods and doing stuff like that. But it, DC is a city. And then Here skateboarding came along. Yeah. You on wheels on any Sunday. Yeah. That's it. It. Yeah. This yeah. is it. Yeah. yeah. So skateboarding came along and we were like, we were, it was like a, we were city kids. And that made sense. Urethane wheels, plenty of concrete. And then it was just like really just we became obsessed with skating. And then, you know, we started meeting other kids in the neighborhood who were skaters. And one kid we met was, you know, I had actually met him before, but we really reconnected was Henry Rollins. We're mm. at the time Henry Garfield. But Henry grew up on W Street, just down the street from me. And I was, I think, 11 years old when I first met him. And I was probably 12 when we started skating together. Um, and he was so knowledgeable about, he was getting, he had skateboarder magazine and he knew so much about skating. So we just became obsessed with skateboarding and, um, we just lived, that's all we did was skate. We just went out and skate. It was a, I still think it, it was a, a perfect way to spend time. And, uh, of course this is before parks. There were no parks and there wasn't. Yeah. It was, you know, you had, you had to go out and make your own world every day. You know, you had to build your own ramps. You had to find your own hills. You had to, you know, just figure it out. And the creativity and that, that was, that was, um, that came, that sort of was required and that was inspired by skateboarding, um, I think really helped stretch the brain to possibility. Right. And, uh, and we formed our own team. We had, we had a team, Team Sahara. Um, and we bought these black and gold mesh jerseys. Didn't have many words on them. But we were like a bunch of DC kids riding around with these jerseys on. And then we'd maybe go to a contest. And these other kids would be like, who are you guys? What are, what are you? Because we, we had no clue that um, we had no clue that teams were supposed to be sponsored. We right. didn't understand that at all. We didn't realize it was a corporate structure. Right. We saw it. We saw it like a street gang, right? Like we were the like we were the Amboy Dukes, or we were the Wanderers, or something. You know, we sure. were that's where we were coming from. As um, you know, we were more of a like on a. We just saw it like we self-identified as a team. We were a set, and uh, and I'm you know, I'm still tight with a bunch of them. I you know I go walking. Mark Sullivan, who sang for King Face, was a Team Sahara member. You know. You know, he was singing in my first band, the Slinkies. And well, well, it's 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 community and culture, isn't it? Right, right. Yeah. It, it, it's 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 community and culture, and I think these templates sort of have the ability to 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 shift from skateboarding to BMX to let's say an early the early hardcore scene or whatever, whatever. And this is, I think, these are a bit of our reference points as we right. as, as we move as we navigate. You know, right. this stuff. So at some point, I'm so really at that point, we're listening, we're listening to a lot of Ted Nugent, Double Live Gonzo, which was sure. a hugely important record. And actually, Henry and I saw uh Ted three times. We went wow, <laughs> we were obsessed with the with Double Live that, that record, especially. Um, yeah. but uh the first show, first rock show I ever saw was Queen and Thin Lizzy. That was January 77. Was that News of the World tour? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, I saw that was great, man. That was great. It was mind blowing. Yeah, it was and great. um <laughs> And then I saw them again, the jazz tour. Um, and, uh, and of course saw Nuge and actually one of the Nuge shows Van Halen opened for Nugent. And I remember thinking I'd heard of them, but just like at that time, any bands that opened for the main band yeah. you ever hated. So we saw kids who were there with Van Halen stuff. And we're like, Oh, you, they suck, but <laughs> they didn't suck. They actually, that was that night. I think I'm afraid 
Ted may have gotten a little, he might've got a little blown off stage at night. They were, they were pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, that time, but rock and roll was just like, I was looking for, we listened to like heavy funk and loud rock and roll. That's what we just wanted stuff to skate to. That was like aggressive music. And, um, and uh, yeah, I just, that's all we were thinking about. We weren't thinking about it as a, uh, as a, it was no longer a, a, a revolutionary form not in the music. The music was a soundtrack to skateboarding, which was a re revolutionary form in my mind. But then you know, when I was in high school, Wilson High School, I have friends who were, um, they were getting into new wave slash punk. And I was pretty leery of it and derisive. And I thought, oh, this is nonsense. You know, this these guys are, it's like a joke. I remember thinking the Ramones, I was like, oh, they're kind of comic booky, And I just couldn't get my mind around it. But also, I had been influenced by mainstream media, which had been very derisive about punk and, and just caught it, you know, since they were very, it was like sensational. They're like, oh, they, they eat their own vomit or whatever, what yeah. stupid bullshit sure. like that. And I was, I was infected by it. You know, I was affected, affected and infected by the, by the media on that. And at some point, you know, arguing with my friends in high school about whether punk sucked, me taking the position that punk sucked. This would have been the fall of 78. Um, right. At some point, somebody said, have you listened to punk? Have you really studied it? And the answer was no. So I borrowed a bunch of records, some from my sister Katie, some from my friend Bert Kuros, who later on was in sure. Double was O. And Double yep. O, yep. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and Bert lived right around the corner from me. We were all from Glover Park. Um, so I borrowed these records and sat in my room and played them and it was a challenge for me because at first it did not sound like music to me my my palate had been trained by the radio and uh putting on the first um damned album the um uh the there's a band called tough dart from new york oh yeah that, that yeah. robert gordon yeah yeah, it was, yeah but this was with tommy frenzy on vocals okay i don't know if robert okay. ever i don't think gordon ever recorded yeah. with him tommy yeah. frenzy did the album uh yeah. Tough the, Cla the Clash first album. The what else you got? Album. The Clash first album. Yeah. The Dam. Yeah. The Dam. The Clash. Um, somebody asked. Somebody asked. What about Devo? Was Devo in that mix? Not yet. No. Uh -uh. Not yet. Okay. I heard them later. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, hmm. Well, and of course, never mind the Bullocks. The Sex Pistols record was in there. And Game Changer. <laughs> and the first of the, so the song I was listening to these records and I just oh this didn't I couldn't make a sense of them. But the Sex Pistols was that was heavy and kind of rock and rolly. Mm -hmm. But then the song Bodies was that's a really solid rock track. But the lyrics were so depraved. Yeah. At that time, I you know even with someone like Nugent who was pretty, like he did a lot of cussing on stage and was really aggressive. But you know his songs were lyrically, I mean whatever. But Bodies was such a dark and deep song and it just hit me that oh this is actually this is music that's asking questions mm. because the other music wasn't asking questions the other music was just sort of yeah was, the other music was just partying that's what that's what rock and roll was it was like that's what you know you're gonna we're gonna get rich we're gonna get laid we're gonna get hot you know we're gonna sure. get high it's just about what they're gonna get whereas punk rock was asking a fucking question it was challenging the thinking and um and that's the world I was looking for. That's what rock and roll was for me when I saw that that um, Rides Again record or that Volunteers record, all that early stuff. I thought they're ch they're asking questions, they're challenging con conventional thinking, they're 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 pushing it. And then it rock and roll became a very kind of complacent kind of thing. But then punk rock came along, and I was like, this is what I'm talking about. This is the this is the world I want to be a part of. I want to be, and I just immediately started studying and just getting, you know, just borrowing as many records as I could. And it was it was really like I I had been um, I found a portal into the world that I had been waiting, been looking for my whole life, and um, I was really excited by it. And the one thing that was interesting though is that. And that's and for, in my world, in DC at least, that punk and skateboarding are kind of opposites. Mm. You know, like the the skateboarding people at the time thought punks were just idiots and 
the punks I knew thought skateboarders were ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so I had to kind of choose. There wasn't a lot of overlap. No, not at that time. So I had yeah, to yeah. choose like, but I thought, well, at that, it really, it, by 1979, a lot of skateboarding had shifted to park culture. And, and when you have skate parks, you have locals and locals are usually dicks. They're just like, they, it's, they just, it's just, they're jocks. So and, sounds uh, like, sounds like surf culture too. Right, it's the same thing. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. It's the same kind of deal. And let's get, let's and, get, let's get Jackie Grisham on and ask him. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. Right. Yeah, so, I, so my feeling really was like, it's just not, I'm like, I'm not a guy. <laughs> Like I'm, I'm into, I like inclusion. I'm not, I don't define right. myself by exclusion. Right. So, on. so, right. um, so skateboarding, like the kind of the park scene was really, you were excluded. You had to work your way in. Right. And, uh, but punk rockers at that time, man, people I met were so, they're just great. And they're so inclusive. Like you were just in, if you wanted to be in, you're welcome. Uh, the first show I saw was the cramps. And the urban verbs and the chumps in February third mm. seventy nine, um, and cramps. That that show was the greatest show of all time for me. That was just the greatest. Um, what I saw that night was confirmed everything I ever hoped for in terms. What's of, that? What's that? Cramps nineteen seventy nine. Yeah, February third seventy nine. Yeah. yeah, there you go. And it was you know they were, uh, the sh and the show itself was in a it was in a a hall at Georgetown university and it was politicized because there had been a radio station here. That was like the only WGTB, which was the only station in town that played any kind of punk, had any kind of alternative programming and the school, Georgetown university, um, they, they sold the station for a dollar. They, <laughs> they hated the station. There was all this controversy between the school and the station and they sold the, they sold the station so then the cramps were playing the show ostensibly to raise money for a, a defense to try to get the station back or something. I don't know what the fuck they were trying to raise money for, but in any event, um, the whatever money was from another planet. In right. And whatever, yeah. And whatever money those guys could, there was a lot of people <laughs> at that show, but any money they could have raised would have had to pay for the damage that occurred at that show. Cause every table and every chair <laughs> Not broken. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, they had it like in a, um, it was set up for like a, a beard. Like in the rec like, room? No, it's like a big hall, but they had, <laughs> had these like folding tables, like maybe 10 folding tables and with like 20 chairs on each one. And it was, I guess the idea was like, it was like a, I don't know, a beer <laughs> garden or something. But sure. the place is packed with people, it was sold out. People were crawling through the windows and trying to break through the back door. Um, and then people were standing on the tables, like there's like, they made 10, 20 people. Like there was like 10 people on the table and then another 10 people on the chairs around them. And then as the show started, people were dancing up and down. The tables were all collapsing. It was really, it was, it was unbelievable that show. And did you know who else was there? It was Guy Pachotto. It was his first show too. Mm. And, you know, and so Guy, I didn't know Guy. He's younger than me and, and went to a different school. But, you know, it was years later, you know, obviously it's Guy from Fugazi, but that was our both of our first shows. Wow. Um, and I went back and I remember telling Henry, I was like, oh, like, it's the greatest. I cut my hair the next day. I was like, I'm, I'm in. And then um, did, did this. So let me let me sort of do a, a little visual here. So was this the impetus that inspired this? I, yeah, indirectly, of course. Yeah, because yeah. I saw the cramps. The thing about the cramps is a lot of their songs are played on one string, so right. I could I could play "Smoke on the Water" on one string. Right. So, the, so basically, we saw the cramps. Like we got to we got to form a band. And so right. I, I was at Wilson High School. There was, you know, I was best friends with Jeff Nelson. Jeff was at that show with me, um, and. Uh, then Jordy Grindle's a year younger than us, but he, uh, he grew up in my neighborhood. And Mark Sullivan was on the skateboard team, and we were all super excited, and we wanted to we should form a band. We decided to form a band. Jeff had played percussion in the school orchestra, so he said he'll be a drummer. Jordy and Mark, that's Jordy in the front there. Now, Jordy and Mark had already been in a band together. I don't think they ever played a show. They're called Dr. Chaos and the Teenage Lobotomies or something like that. <laughs> um 
Of course they were. And, they, and Mark was singing and Jordy played guitar. So I said, I guess I'll play bass because and I could play bass because I could play Smoke on the Water on one string. And we just started practicing. We just got together and started practicing to be a band. And it was, um, we played one show. That was the Slinkies. Oh, that was the um, Slinkies. Yeah, right, this was before right. the Teen Idols. This is uh, before the Teen Idols. Yeah, right. so we, we, we played one show in August of 79 uh, and at, Mark, friend's, at, at your friend's garage, and Mark right? Mark was singing. What's that? Yeah, and, and, a, yeah a garage, ooh. right? Yo, yeah. Glenn. So, um, sorry, Glenn. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so then, uh, yeah, my uh, brother. <laughs> but he, uh, uh, so um, we did the one show with Mark, and then Mark went off to Colgate College, and then uh, we had to get another singer. So we asked Nathan, and that's how the Teen Idols formed. I see. Yeah. And. This hold on, I want to, I want to pop this up right after. Um, so th things get rolling with the Teen Idols, and eventually, let's walk just real quick. The um, the impetus to, hey, let's record ourselves, and how do we get our music out there? Right. We well, we first did a, we did our first tape in the spring of nineteen eighty. We started playing our first shows in December of 79 and we recorded a tape in like May, March or something like that. And it was weird. It didn't sound like us. It, it just felt weird because the guy right. was the guy that was recording us was sort of, he was making the guitar sound the way he thought guitar should sound and not the way we, they sounded for us. Right. Um, and we did another tape with him. We didn't know about any other studios. So it was just one studio. And we went to it, did another tape. And that second one was a little better, but it just still wasn't, didn't sound like it was too tame sounding. Um, but then we started talking to this. We were, we used to go to this record store called Yesterday and Today, run by Skip Groff. And, mm -hmm. and we were talked to Skip. We said, we're really frustrated. And he goes, well, you should, I can take you to this studio called Inner Ear where I've done some recording. So we went in the August of of eighty, I guess we went to Inner Ear here in Arlington, not far from Discord House. Um, and and this this was the original Inner Ear when it was when it, when it was in Don's uh, in his house in the basement. Right? Yeah, in the basement. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And it's where it is now, by the way. Back He's back, back in the basement. Return yeah. to the basement. Yeah, yeah I I just recorded my sister's band Bedmaker there, and it's great. <laughs> That's sound great. Back That's in great. the basement, but uh, the um. So we went there and at that time it was just hit a four track and um, it was, we played in the rec room downstairs. It was, you know, it was a really funny scene, but we made this recording and that sounded pretty damn good to us. We liked it. Uh, the band shortly thereafter, Jordy quit the band, the guitar player, and he just was sick of being in the band. And I wanted to sing. I had written a lot of the lyrics hmm. and um yeah and i i knew how i could hear in my head how i how they should be sung um and nathan too, who's a great singer it just but just didn't sound the way i heard the songs the way i i would have sung them um and going back you know i was obsessed with janis joplin and 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 joe cocker i really felt like i wanted to sing with just full emotion on stage like that's what i wanted can I can I interject? I, I, I put this uh, I put this clip aside because you mentioned oh, yeah. you you mentioned Woodstock, yeah, and and now you sort of you, you mentioned Joe Cocker, yeah, and uh, as being an influence, of course, uh, yeah, of course, this incredible iconic influ uh, uh, performance from, yeah. from from Woodstock of Joe Cocker, yeah, right, that's the one, yeah, yeah. So that was so mostly just how. Full on it was like he just yeah. throws down so hard. One hundred percent, man. You know, and and yeah. it was scary and scary because he. I thought maybe he was having a some kind of fit. I mean, the way he was moving, it just was. Un, it was not at all um, as you can yeah. see in this footage. You can see that he was. It wasn't a smooth performance. You know, he's just throwing down, and I didn't. I wasn't trying to emulate him per se, but I was trying to. Um, I think what I was trying to do was approach music in the same free manner to sure. go down, just to, just throw down and be, be as goofy as I wanted on stage, you know, to do whatever I just, just be whatever, just do what I wanted to do. Be fucking free. That's what I'm trying to be free. And, um, 
And that was really the beginning of Meyer Threat because I had written some songs. You know, I'd written at that point, Stand Up was written and Straight Edge. I think I started, I was writing and I, you know, we were just, um, it was, yeah, it was, it was off to the races. And there was a band called the Extorts who were these kids from GDS, Georgetown Day School, where a lot of punks went, like Brian mm-hmm. Baker, um, Guy Pachotto, uh, Michael Hampton, all these guys were, Michael, Michael Hampton was in the Extorts. The Extorts were a band that essentially, it was the band, Henry's band, SOA, but with Lyle Pressler singing. Wow. And then, so they broke up. And then, I did not know that. Yeah. And Lyle actually, he was always, he's actually a guitar player, but he was singing because Michael Hampton didn't want to, didn't want to sing. So Lyle sang. So they, they always, they were kids and they were fighting all the time. So they just, that just exploded. <laughs> so then I said, I, we had met those guys, um, really through the untouchables. My brother, those guys had, um, there's like little camps, little tiny sure. uh, pockets of punks and, that, so that, that cross there. pollinated. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, we're all sort of in the same area, so we would cross paths and like, who are those kids? Um, but uh, so we asked Lyle if he wanted to play guitar, and I've and I showed him the songs. I was playing bass still, and Jeff was doing drums, and Lyle was. I mean, Lyle's just an incredible guitar player, and uh, so it was right from the get go, it was just off to the right. And then we just found. And then Brian came to play bass, and it was on. And And here's, this is the, I I guess, you know, this is minor threat Mark one, right? The first April, April 4th, 1981. That's at the Wilson center. It's a show that the bad brains put on. And actually, let me see. Yeah. That looks like that's John Wiffenbach leaning in the back, back there. That's the singer of void on the, in the background. And you Mm -hmm. can see that's Lyle on the front with a guitar, Brian on a bass and me singing. And you can't tell who's down there and who's singing along with me. You know, G- uh, Gary, Gary, CC Fly NYAC asks, were the bad brains already in the mix? Of course. Yeah. That first time yeah. uh, I was aware of the bad brains early on. Like I had heard about, first of the when I went to see the cramps at that show, <laughs> there was these guys there and they were the coolest looking punks. And they had this, <laughs> they're dressed so cool. They had like these suits with like white hand prints on them and, um, <laughs> One of them had bleached hair, his hair was bleached, right. and they had bad brains written on their backs. We're like, who are those guys? And they're putting flyers around town just talking about, you know, the bad they put these flyers, say, bad brains, are you ready? We are. That's all it said. You're like, who what the <laughs> fuck? You know? And right. then um I think there was a there was a kid in my high school who knew them or had a tapes of them or something. I remember I can't remember if I heard the tape first or if I saw them first, but in any event, they opened for the damned in June of 79. And I, I was 17 years old at that time to get into a club. You had to be 18. It was a, the drinking age for beer and wine in DC was 18 and spirits was 21. But sure. so the clubs all said you had to be 18 to get in. And I was 17 and the Bayou, which is this kind of was a sleazy rock club. Um, it was impossible there. You know, you couldn't get in if you didn't have an ID, they're really tough about it and but the damned were coming and you know the damned that was like our band that was yeah. one of the band like sure we really like there are certain bands in washington that were really important the damned were one of those bands right and and the bad ranger opening for them so i had to go to the show and i had a friend who was a naval sea cadet um and he was a bit of a, a, a ne'er-do-well and he had stolen a stack of um ID cards from his commander's <laughs> desk. Um, and they were unlaminated. Um, and they didn't even have photos on them, but they had all the data on them. Wow, what a score. Um, <laughs> so I went over and I went through them and I picked one that was one year older than me and had roughly I had blue eyes and I had blondish hair at the time. So that's what it, the description. And then this is the day of the f- show. I remember that we used a Polaroid camera and took a photo. I stood against a sheet, like I'm pretending like I'm, a, I'm a, at attention. And I think Henry took a photo of me and then we cut the Polaroid, all that weird goop behind it. And we cut it out, the Polaroid photo to my face and put it on there. And I went to a local drugstore and bought a home laminating kit, which doesn't work and um, did a really shitty lamination job. And then we went down to the show and we we're online and I gave my ID to the bouncer and he's looking, he's like, I'm not taking this. 
And I wish I could remember, I don't, maybe it was me, but I, my record is somebody else said this, but everyone I've asked who was there that I've asked doesn't remember saying it. But somehow it was someone said to the bouncer, I'm sorry, you're not going to accept a U.S. military ID? And then the bouncer looked at the other bouncer and the guy just sort of shrugged. He's like, all right, just go in. Just get, just, just leave me alone. Oh, yeah. Just, just, just get inside. And the Bad Brains opened that show. And I mean, I knew right. I knew there that DC had the greatest band in the world. Like that was just, they were the best. That show yeah. was incredible. And the damned were also incredible, you know, and no, you know, great show is doesn't, you know, the, no great show is complete without spending, spending the night in an emergency room because my sister got hit in the head with a bottle and we had to go to the hospital afterwards. Your, and, your, your sister? So I, I, I don't hear your sister mentioned much in in, in, sort of in in this era. She frequented these these sort of melees. My my si older sister Katie was really she knew a lot about music and she and she went she loved punk shows. So mm. she wasn't she was never like a punk rocker. Right. But she right. just knew a lot. Well, she, where she is? Well, she was a. She's kind of a punk, but we were like, you know, she's five years older than me, and right. she didn't live in town at the time. She may have been living here, but she's really instrumental. In my like, she took me in my first show, that Queen show. She took wow. me to that. Um, uh, but yeah, she went to that damn show, and she got hit in the head. Someone, someone threw a bottle and hit her, and we ended up. She had to be rat scaped. Had to pull her on stage. Cause she was like bleeding profusely. Oh man. She said to me, she, I was, we were right by the front of the stage and she grabbed me from behind and she said, somebody's punched me in the head and somebody else is bleeding. And I looked at her and her shirt was drenched with blood and her oh. face was covered with blood. I go, you're bleeding. And then scabies came out from behind the drum set and just grabbed her and pulled her up on stage. And then this is so typical. We just were like, okay, great. She's fine. Let's watch the rest of the show. And then after the show, I found her in the kitchen. And it, was like of, it was like a badge of honor. It was like a badge of honor back yeah, then. It was you know, incredible. Like, but um, yeah, but the, that's when I first saw the Bad Brains. And then I got their tapes. That's Henry dancing at a Meyer. It, it looks. It, it looks DC like he's, almost, he's checking to see what time it is. What is. But yeah, yeah, Henry's dancing. Yeah, that's the strut, man. We were doing. Uh, um, how, how 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 did how did Brian Baker come across your radar screen? I mean, he was a bit younger than you guys, right? A little bit, yeah. I mean, Lyle's two years, I think two years younger, or let me see, Lyle's, I think he's two years younger than us, and Brian, I think, is four years younger. Brian went, all those guys went to school together. They all went to Georgetown Day School. So Brian was on the scene, and we needed a, needed a bass player, and um, Lyle had mentioned Brian, because I didn't know that Brian was a guitar player. I just knew he could play guitar, but you know, whatever. I didn't realize he was. Little actually, did we know he actually played with Carlos Santana. Right. right. I didn't find that out till later. Yeah, yeah. But, so I said, you know, I think I remember we were at. Um, my recollection is that we were sitting together at this hamburger joint called Good Old Phil's next door to the Georgetown Movie Theater. We all worked, and uh, we said, "Oh, do you want to? Do you want to? You know, do you want to be in the band?" And Brian was like, "I'd do anything to be in the band." Aww. Like he was like, you know, he was so into it and he's, he was a brilliant musician. And I can remember him sure is. You know, showing him like, I, even at that age, I'd show him a song. He said, that's good. But you know, if you, if you just did this, it would be even better. I'm like, Oh my wow. God. You're right. That's weird. Yo. Um, as, as a 16 year old, right? Yeah. Oh um, yeah. Six, 15 or 16. Amazing. 1980. Yeah. I can't remember. It's, it's funny. I think he was born in 65. Or 66. But anyway, yeah, he was young. And um and it was uh it was yeah, he but he was those guys were really good. Brian and Lyle both could play, and Jeff had become a great drummer. Yeah. Um very so very, just, very unorthodox. Yeah, Jeff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he created a form. Yeah, he you did. Know, one thing Jeff did, I remember is that he and I think I think this is I think he came up with this is that most at that time a lot of drummers you crossed your sticks you would that's right play hi hat and snare that's right so every time you hit the snare you have to kind of take a little break in your hi hat but right. Jeff just moved the hi hat to the side yeah you know so sort of this uh, he moved yeah. the snare to the side so you never had to cross your sticks because yep. he just thought it, he just thought like it would be more driving if you could just keep rocking that hi hat and 
Um, yeah, open handed. Uh, yeah. Drummer Mike says he played open handed. I guess. Oh, okay. There guess, you go. Yeah. That's what I guess. That's what I guess. It's yeah. open, yes, open handed. Well, I don't think we had any idea at the time. We were not again. We were coming from his. Like Brian had some musical background, I guess, but Jeff and I, Jeff didn't, his parents didn't play music. There wasn't like, there wasn't, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We were just making it up as we went along. So that was that. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. You know, so doing a little homework. Um, so, so the first sort of incarnation of minor threat, you, you, you did the rounds and uh, played, um, uh, the first lineup only played 22 shows. Uh, I, I mean, more or less. Uh, and and uh, correct me if I'm right, it seems to me like you only played out of town really only a couple of times with the first sort of uh, on the first go round a minor threat. That's true. We Well, we didn't play New York, that's for sure. But we also right. were never, we were like, ah, we're not going to play New York. We you made it out to the West Coast for one show. Is that right? No, that was Teen Idols. That was Teen Idols. Okay. Teen Idols. That's the band. The first show we ever played outside of Washington, really, not counting um, like Maryland or Virginia right by, but the first outside the D.C. area was Los Angeles, California. We took a Greyhound bus across the country the, you know, <laughs> to play one show in L.A. and one show in San Francisco. And That's to, great. To people who we had no record out. Ah, youth. Ah, youth. It was amazing. <laughs> it was, I mean, yo. Yeah. It's just, it was, it and was did amazing. you, did you, did you bring, I mean, did, was it, was there a, uh, was there an entourage? I would assume that, that, that if you're going, Hey, I want to go, I want to be a part of well, this. Well, we had, we were not an entourage exactly, but we had two roadies. We had Henry and Mark Sullivan, you know, okay. Henry, we had, it was funny. We brought a guitar, a bass and a pair of drumsticks and two roadies. Um, we also arrived in LA because in DC, like if you were going to play a show, you could just bring your guitar you didn't have to bring a guitar, probably the band would let you use anything. So we had just assumed that when we got to LA, that we would just use the other band's gear. That's not how they did it there, though. That's, That's not, right. They were That's not. Right. We played at the Hong Kong um, Cafe uh, yeah. with um, Vox Pop, who were sort of associated with 45 Grave. Um, okay. And, um, you know, the Don Bowles from the drummer of the Germans was in that band, sure. and Paul Cutler and other people. And then um, a band called uh, Puke Spit and Guts, which was this weird band from Victorville and um, kind of weird uh, punk adjacent, but they have an album where between every song was just sounds of chainsaws and babies screaming. <laughs> um, and then uh, the Mentors, they're on that bill. And wow. so when we got there, um, I remember I had brought my bass and I tried to put new strings on to, you know, I'm a professional and uh, my bass only had three strings. The fourth peg had broken off years. I never had any use for it anyway. So I only played on three strings. I put the new strings on and then I was trying to tune it. And of course there was no tuner. I didn't have a tuner. Like who had a tuner? There was no such thing as a tuner really. Didn't um, exist yet. Yeah. You'd use a tuning fork or a piano to kind of get it into the ballpark. And uh, so I'm sitting out front in this little plaza area in front of the Hong Kong trying to tune the bass and I tuned it way too tight. Like that it was way too high. So when I got to the D string, the third string, I was trying to get into tune and it snapped. <laughs> so now I had two strings. Two oh my strings. gosh. So then I tried to learn all, relearn all the songs. That if I ever touch that third string, I tried to learn them all on those two strings. And then the second string snapped. <laughs> and of course, the, of course there was never a contingency for anything no. like this. No. So I have one string. Um, <laughs> at that point, we had to borrow not only the back line, the drums and the amps, but I needed a bass. And, right. you know, at first we were really, the bands were not cool, but then in the end they actually let us use our stuff. Um, and I used a mentor's bass. I used Paul Cutler from um, Vox Pop's bass. And I played through the mentor's um, cabinet uh, or their, their bass amp. And I blew it up. Oh, and I was terrified. Ooh. I was scared of those guys. They were scary mentors. And we ran, we had to do a runner. Like we had to, like they were looking for us in the night. We were running. Of course, we didn't have a car. We had come on a bus. So we had to, we didn't want to wait. We ran back, we ran back to the Greyhound station. We, no, we have taken a, we had taken, we were staying with my great uncle in Pasadena. And we'd taken a, we had to take the, the city bus back to Pasadena, which is, that's a big deal. And, uh, 
But if you're running from guys who are trying to kill you, waiting at a bus stop is not the move. Yeah. So he hailed a cab to get away from them. Wow. But that, it's, oh, oh, the drama. Yeah, it's yeah. good, good oh. work. But on that oh. trip to that point, I should say that we went to San Francisco after that, and we had a gig. We were supposed to open a show. Check out the show. We were the Teen Idols were supposed to play on this show. Dead Kennedys, Flipper, Circle Jerks. There you go. And it was a Circle Jerks first show in San Francisco. Um, and Teen Idols was supposed to be on the bill. But when we got there, the promoter, this guy, Dirk Dirksen, God rest his soul. Amazing you guy. remember this. Yeah, Dirk had dropped us from the bill <laughs> because he didn't like the photo we sent him. Oh, jeez. Which is insane. He didn't tell us. We'd taken a, a Greyhound bus across the country, and he dropped us from the bill and refused to let us play. And then everybody was yelling at him, all the people from like, – we had friends at Target Video and Damage Magazine, and they were yelling at him. He finally agreed to let us play the next day, which was um, this kind of new wave day. Um, but that Dead Kennedy Circle Jerks show, the Circle Jerks had come up with a whole contingent of, you know, HBs, Huntington Beach punks. Right. So Tony Alva, who's a skateboard hero of ours, Tony was with him, his brother Mark, I think Mugger, who was the roadie for Black Flag. The, in, the um, infamous Mugger. Right. Mugger, Drew Bernstein, yep. who ran, um, with that, uh, he was in America's was, Hardcore. Was this, was this uh, Mabuhay Ma 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 Gardens? Mabuhay Gardens. Mabuhay Ma Ma Gardens. Ma yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, and Drew Bernstein, who was in America's Hardcore, and then he was also, he had a, what's his clothing company? Um, what was it? Uh, lipstick? What's it called? Affliction? He had a famous, he had a pretty popular clothing thing later, in recent years. He died not long ago, and sadly. Hmm. But, um, but um, he, um, those guys, and there was Critter and Michelle, this guy, Greg, who ended up being that band Red Cross and then Salvation Army. So all these kids from L.A. came up and like we were in San Francisco and there was like the D.C. contingent and the L.A. contingent. And then they're like the San Francisco crowd. And you could really tell like those guys are not from San Francisco and they could tell we are not from San Francisco and we just connected. And this is one of the great, I think, really beautiful things about punk at that time was that it was so regional. That, you know, nobody, we didn't have any moving footage. You couldn't see bands play. Sure. Um, you didn't have any idea how people moved. You just saw still photos. And then you saw, you heard the records. So then all of a sudden we're having, like, we're able, like, when you go to these different towns, you you're, see you're, seeing, you're to, seeing it for the first time right. it, it, in real time. Right. But everybody had to develop their own style. So yeah. every town, every city, New York, Boston, D.C., you know, Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, Reno, uh, San Francisco, uh, L.A., Austin. All these scenes had super regional scenes and styles. And they're instantly identified. You could see somebody go like, that kid is from, just by the way they danced, right. you could tell. Oh, 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 oh that slow and low creepy crawl right, style? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's got to be one of, you know, that's yeah. a Huntington Beach guy, right? That's where I came from. That's where yeah, yeah. we were so sure. blown away. We wow. hung out with those guys, and they were they were terrifying. They were feral, but it was and they, really, and they were big. Uh, they were big kids, right? They were either big or just they were uh, they were fearless. I don't. I yeah. mean, they were really Perfect. the stuff that was going on was mind blowing. Um, mm -hmm. And the circle jerks. I mean, I was Black Flag was like one of the most important bands of all time. That first single was so hugely important for me and Henry and everybody else. So we knew about Circle Jerks. We knew that Keith had gone to sing for this new band, Circle Jerks. So seeing them, this is before the record came out. I mean, they were amazing. It was just an incredible show. And the Dead Kennedys were great. And Flipper were great, even though they were hard to just, I mean, they were shocking. The Dead Kennedys, I think, a little bit have been lost in the shifting sands of time. How great they were in, the, in those yeah. days. They, they were fantastic. They yeah. were a great live band. Uh, with with, with Jello in those, mm -hmm. you know, 80, 81, 82. They were fucking great. I remember after the show, we got back, you know, we always tried to get backstage because the way I looked at it is like the band, the audience, the same thing. So fuck a backstage. We're going back to say hello. So we went back sure. and we were talking to Biafra and 
you know, we're like, we're from DC. And he was like, really interested in asking us lots of questions about DC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the whole time I'm looking at him, I'm thinking like, my God, I can't believe he's, he's a punk. He's still a punk and he's 22 years old. Yeah, right. Like, right. <laughs> you know, it was amazing because right. he just sure. seemed like the oldest guy sure. he was 24 sure. or something. But, um, yep. but it was really that, that experience really, um, affected us. So when we came back, we really, then we were like, we're on a mission now. Like this to see the power of, of music and, and the punk underground was so intense. So yep. then with, with Meyer Threat, we definitely, we definitely were trying to get to the West Coast. We had booked a tour to go all the way out to the West Coast. It was Meyer Threat and the DC Youth Brigade. Um, and we had actually booked shows in California. Um, and so, some along the way, we got as far as Madison, Wisconsin. And Mad then, town. Yeah, the, uh, yep. we played this band, Bloody Mattresses, at a place called Merlin's. Um, and uh, But then the guitar player for the Youth Brigade, Tommy Clinton, we were using, basically we were touring in his van, his parents' van, oh boy. my 1970 Plymouth Duster and Brian Baker's mother's Volvo wagon. And it was the two bands and about eight other 14 year old kids, like a whole crew of us. And we, I don't know what, I have no idea what would have happened if we didn't get stopped in Madison. Cause we were really going to drive across the country and we had no money. It was going to be, it was going to be an insane trip, but so we lost the tour because the van, oh, his parents called and said, you have to bring the van home. So that, oh, that, that, that put an end to it. <laughs> so he, they left and then Meyer threat, we stayed in our two cars. We didn't have any back line anymore, but we ended up staying with the necros um, in uh, mommy. And, uh, and then we went, um, we played up in Windsor with them um, in Canada. And then we came on home, you know, that was, that was the, so that was kind of towards the end of the we played a few more shows and then Lyle went to college. We broke up and he went to Northwestern University. And that was the end, really, for Meyer Thread. Um, let, let me ask you, let me let me uh, ask you about somebody. Uh, okay. Um, here's the question and here's the visual. Ian, the production of Minor Threats recordings is perfect. Nothing sounds anything like it. All you were spot on. Could you give us a little perspective on uh, on on the two seven inch recordings? You know uh, how they were recorded. You know qu quickly what the circumstances were. Are, are you happy with them in retrospect? Yeah, I think the first record is perfect. You know, I love that. Right? I think I love both records, but that first record, I remember when we record. We recorded at Don's studio, and it was a four track, and we had this real emphasis on the idea that the bass and the guitar should be like one thing practically. It should mm -hmm. just be like everything should be locked in and super tight and then to, and to really to give um, and let the, so the, the singing can really kick off of that, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I really love like small man, big mouth. I always just love the way that song sounded and, and just the way the, again, those, those, those guys played so well. And there's another thing about minor threat that was, I think of quite a departure for most punk bands, certainly in Washington is that, one of the early arguments we had um, is that Lyle wanted to buy a strobe, a strobe tuner. Um, yeah. And a strobe tuner was this giant unit that um, yeah. you could actually tune guitars with. And yeah. uh, it cost like $180, which at that time was It was a big deal. <laughs> insane. Yeah. And I thought he was out of his fucking mind to want to buy a strobe tuner. I was so against it because it didn't seem punk to me at all. Right. But Lyle was like, I'm going to get a strobe tuner. And he did. Wow. And as a result, Meyer Threat was the band that was in tune. Like we were in tune. We tuned our guitars. So if you listen to like live tapes of like SOA or, or other mm -hmm. bands, a lot of times like Meyer Threat's in tune. And other bands, you're not going to hear them. They're just more out, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think we. And, and, and excuse me, the less Paul that yeah, Lyle is playing is yeah. in tune and tune and yeah. the other thing about lyle is that he plays bar chords for those guitar players out there but he mm -hmm. plays with all six strings mm. like i play with three strings like sure. i i'm a cheater <laughs> but lyle plays all six. Right. yeah he plays all six and he's um he was just a, a, he's a great guitar player and yeah. the uh and of course we had been come up watching the bad brains 
Right. And the bad brains, their commitment to precision yeah. and practice, we took it really seriously. We practiced as much as we could. It was always about like we were going to, yeah, we were always going to win the night. That's what we were going to, we wanted to play. I didn't give a fuck when we played. We could open or close. But if we opened, I feel sorry for the people playing after us. Mm-hmm. If you open, and if we close, and I hope people remember the other bands. That was the way I looked at. It. We were, you know, we wanted to be, we wanted to be good. We just wanted to be a good band. So those those recording sessions, there there is one interesting thing about this four track. The way we recorded was drums on one track, bass on a second track, guitars on a third track, and on the fourth track was the vocals, the backing vocals, and hmm. very occasional guitar overdubs, maybe. Um, <laughs> so as a result. I couldn't do the vocals live. I had to do, so we had to record the music first. I might do kind of a scratch vocal to make sure that the timing was right. And then, then when the, we decided that okay, that's a good version, then I would go do, we'd go back in and then I would stand at one mic and the other guys would stand at another mic and we would do the the vocals and the backing vocals. Mm-hmm. Um, at at the, the same time, v- yeah. lead vocals, background vocals. In the same room at the same time. Yeah. Got it. Mm-hmm. And uh, back and vocals are really important for like they. I, it was always for me. It was always about singing. Like the I want the whole room singing. Uh, like I love the the live side of the Sham '69 album. You know sure. that like that record that live side. I just thought, oh, that's yeah. Actually, I, you know, Henry, you you, you, you 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 feel the room. You you right. you, feel, you feel the the ambience and the essence of the room. Absolutely. Right. I want, but also every song I wrote, I I, I want people to. I want them to sing. You know, if you look at my threat stuff, I'm always like, I want people to sing. I want the whole room to sing. And, uh, yeah. you know, actually, Henry and I, in November of 79, we came to New York to see Sham. We saw him at Hurrah with a band called the Reds, I think they were called. That's my, um, it's, called, that's my neighborhood right here. Right yeah. here. I live in that neighborhood. Yep. Hurrah. That was our first that was our first time in New York. That was our first show up there. And I uh, saw in 1978, I saw Suicide at Hurrah's. Wow. All right. Yeah. 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 So uh, that Champs United show was was um, it was they were okay it was not what we expected but it was cool it was cool to see them and yeah. we of course loved them so when I was in Meyer Threat I really wanted the singing I wanted the great backing vocals people singing along um, and of course I wanted to you know I wanted people to uh, I had things to say was <laughs> was were the two seven inches recorded at the same time or did you no. go in you, you went into like. You went in to do in my eyes. You re- you went in to record four tracks. We actually recorded two tracks. Um, wow. We the reason we had written a bunch of songs. Um, the eight songs that were on the single, and then there was stand up. Right. Uh, one two X U. Uh, and one two X U. We rec- we had um, we had recorded those, but they were sort of kind of like on the on the shelf. Uh, and then the summer of 1981, we wrote Out of Step and In My Eyes. And um, we were uh, and we we're breaking up. So it was like, let's just go record those two last songs. I see. So we went in and recorded the two last songs. And then once Lyle was gone, you know, we were discussing, well, how we should put this out. But it seemed like a ripoff to do a seven inch with just two songs on it. That I seems see. pretty straight. I but see. we we had... We had on our first demo, we had recorded Stepping Stone and Guilty of Being White, which never had come out. And Stepping Stone was, we, we had sort of recorded not we, everybody in DC, all the band, all the punk bands played Stepping Stone. Right. So I remember I called up Don Zentera. We never even mixed that track. You know, we just had a rough mix of it. So I called Don and said, Can you put together another mix of that so we can, like, can you just do a mix of it? So we can send it to put on this record to on the B side. Mm-hmm. And he said, sure, come on over. You know, I, I went over there a couple of days later and he played me his mix. And it started out like this little tiny, tinny thing. And I couldn't, I thought I was confused by it. And then I just thought, oh, he's playing. This is a joke to him because I'm, I'm like, for me, I'm, I'm real literal. I was like, that's what the song was the song. And we're not doing any studio trickery, you know, but Don had done this really crazy mix. And, um, 
and I was furious with him. I actually yelled at him. I was like, what the fuck are you, you fucking with our music? You know, and then, but then he, uh, and then I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, this is actually pretty cool. So that's the weird, that mix it's on the B side, that yeah. and Guilty Being White. Those right. are two songs we put on the B side just to make it a four song record instead of a two song record. <laughs> that's that's in in interesting. Um, let's, do you, you want to take a quick little break here and, ca and catch your breath and then we'll bring Glenn on or do you want to just keep running at it? That's fine. I'm fine. I can drink a cup of tea. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, 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 let's take a, let's take a tea, a, a sip of tea. This is for all our friends out there around the world. So all right. Go. Hello people. Um, let's bring Glenn on. Sure. And, uh, and, and let's, let's, uh, let me get my, my Glenn intro here. Okay, here we go. Glenn, let me see. Glenn, you out there? Okay, here we go. Um, please welcome back to the show an artist, photographer, and author, and producer known for his activities with rebellious skateboarding and music culture. Photographing artists, Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, Circle Jerks, Misfits, Ice-T, Beastie Boys, Run DMC, Public Enemy, Fagazi, Minor Threat, and many, many more. His photography has been published in close to a dozen of his books, as well as other publications, including record covers, and has been exhibited in art galleries and museums all around the world. Back with us today to talk to us about his new book, We're Just a Minor Threat. Please welcome back, coming at us from right down the island from where I am, of Manhattan, Mr. Glenn E. Friedman. Buddy. <laughs> Yo. How, how are you, you, how you feeling, you Glenn? I'm feeling, I don't know why you're having me on when Ian is just at you know, what is he in 1981? An hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> Am I here to break up the party? It's okay. And I'm just, I'm just having a, a light bout of COVID, just getting over it still. And uh, so, you know, I won't be my loud self as usual, maybe. But we'll see how this goes. Yeah, we'll bounce the ball a little bit back and forth. Uh, let's start with, you know, Ian mentioned early on, you know, skateboarding was was a, a big part of the community and the culture. Is that what is that what initially? Uh, Put to made you guys gravitate to each other. I think that uh, well, I, <clears throat> Glenn was gotten to punk. You know, he was living in New York and L.A., so he'd seen the Bad Brains really early on, and he was right there in L.A. seeing all the early stuff. Um, and the skateboarders. I, mean, I said earlier about how skateboarding and punk were kind of opposite. That was very short lived, right? Like then suddenly, you know, you, know, you have you know. Um, Steve Olson and uh, uh, um, uh, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Peter, and um, the and the Alba brother. Everyone just cutting their hair off. Jay Adams. Everybody was getting into punk. It was it was so it was just kind of amazing that skateboarders suddenly were like like so in and um, and then uh, so Glenn was really there and I guess Rollins. You know Rollins, of course Henry. You know he was. You know, he and I were best friends and we were spending all this time together. Then he got to sing for Black Flag. They, you know, Black Flag had come to town and stayed in my house. And we all got to be really, they stayed at my parents. I was still living at home. And uh, they stayed with us and they played the 930 Club. And we hung out with them a lot. And then we stayed and we were always calling, talking on the phone. And they, at some point, without me knowing, they, Henry tried out for them. I remember, I mean, we all knew that Dez wanted to play guitar and that they were looking for another singer. And I think in flip side magazine had been a a um like an article written about like who's gonna sing for Black Flag. So we were all wondering who's gonna sing for you know, we were all like who's gonna sing for Black Flag? And then I get this call from Henry and he says, Guess who's singing for Black Flag? And I said, I don't know, is it you know, you know, mugger? I mean I whatever, and he's like, Me. And I said, what? Like, what are you talking about? And he had gone to New York and tried out. And and they they said, you're in if you want to be in. So then he joined Black Flag. I drove him to the get ground station and he went to go meet them in Detroit. And that was it. That was 19. That was summer of 81. And I think shortly after that, Glenn met Henry. Um, is that about right, Glenn? Yeah, I mean, I think Drew was asking earlier about skateboarding and stuff, and I'd have to say that, you know, Ian and I met, as he famously remembers, um, on December 26th. December 26th. At the CBGB. Right? Yeah, 81. Yeah. 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 So yeah. The reason I bring up Henry is because you were, that's how you first heard about us, and we've kind of gotten to touch like with the DC stuff. I think you started, that's, as I recall, your 
you had met Henry. And then so I was excited because I wouldn't see the bad brains and the faith at CBGB's December 6, 20, de December 26, 1981. And that's when I met you that night. That was that was really I mean, Glenn. I, of course, knew Glenn's photos because I was a skateboarder. And yeah. so and Henry had called me and said, I met Glenn Friedman, which was incredible. You know, Glenn Friedman. So we are psyched. Yeah. Um, Glenn, let, let's let's uh, let's cut to the bone a little bit here. Um, what was is that possible? Tell us a little bit. Yes, it is. We could do that. Tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, why now? What was the impetus to, to put, putting the book together now? And, and what does the book compose? Um, I think, well, the, the reason the book came out is because I, you know, just a year before, as I announced on your show for the very first time anywhere, I was doing a black flag book and I was really happy with how that turned out. You know, usually most of my books, I'm just trying to put out the very best of the best. I'm not trying to, you know, give you everything. I'm just trying to give you what I see as the best images that represent everything the best. But when I went around and did the black flag book with much, you know, uh, support and editorial assistance from Ian, um, it came out really great. And I was really happy to share all those photos. I didn't realize that, you know, that we could tell even, I mean, the photos were always there, but why should they sit in my files? And just because I don't think they're the most perfect images all the time, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, why am I going to put these out? But then, you know, there was a, I just thought, you know, I'm going to do it. And again, with Ian's help, we edited through stuff. We took months and months and months and uh, looking at pictures and, you know, trying to edit this here and there. And it just came out great. I was totally stoked on how the Black Flag book came out. Mm, it was yeah, really great. great, you know. And, uh, you know, as everyone knows, this is the one with uh, Henry's first show that I shot. Um, at the Cuckoo's you know, Nest. And yeah, at the Cuckoo's Nest. And that was, um, you know, that was a lot thanks to Ian that we made that happen. And then, you know, just some time goes by and I'm just thinking, you know, maybe I'm going to do the same thing for minor threat. And I start scanning some more photos that I haven't seen ever before since I made the original rolls of film. And, you know, I just spoke to Ian about it and I just said, you know, what do you think about this? And he was all supportive of it. I was very surprised because I know, you know, they're working on their own projects and, um, you know, but I had all these photos and we said, you know, what the hell? And, you know, Johnny Temple, who you guys all know, who's uh, who's publishing most of my books now over at Akashic, he was all about it, too. And then, you know, I mentioned it to a couple of different people and we had, you know, uh, actually, I was planning on doing another book. And then uh, Zach, you know, De La Rocha said, you got to do Minor Threat next. And I was really surprised by that because I was thinking someone else that he's more closely associated with and. You know, I said, well, yeah, you know, maybe. And then he said, no, you have to do that. And so I spoke to Ian and I spoke to, uh, you know, the people involved and everyone was like, yeah, let's do minor threat. And I said, okay, fuck it, let's do it. And um, yeah, that's a picture from the barn. I think that's the first time I shot minor threat. Um, yeah, that's in LA on uh, July 3rd, 1982, right, Ian? Correct. And and I think I think what's what's pretty interesting, Glenn, is that, you really you shot minor threat four times five times i think just three live shows one in la one in new york and one in dc amazing i mean the thing was drew is that when i made pictures i made them to count but I'm, right. I, I never considered myself a documentarian i wanted to inspire other people it's like i've got all these great fucking shots so what am i going to do with them now that I have them. I don't need to shoot the band again necessarily because I've already got great shots, right? There was no place publishing in them, unfortunately. There was no right. place to put them out unless Minor Threat was going to use some in a record sleeve and maybe in a fanzine they would get used, you know, postage stamp size, which, you know, coming from Skateboarder Magazine days, you know, I'm spoiled. I'm used to good, high quality printing and big, beautiful photos. So, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't really... Um, wasn't necessary at the time to shoot every gig. I mean, I got great, you know, I look, look at this shot, you know, this is equivalent to my shot of black flag that everyone knows. And, uh, you know, these guys just going off to the extreme, you know, I, I love this shot. And as I know Ian does and Lyle and everyone likes the shot, it just, you know, and that's at the 930 club. Right. It makes, and, and, you know, you mentioned getting this stuff out there. And one of the ways, I mean, to sort of harken back to that era, uh, you put out my rules, which was, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to call that a, a fanzine, but it, it was, a you know, the DIY ethos, man. You need, you wanted to get your stuff out there. You kind of had to do it yourself, right? It, it was a fanzine. It was I did it all by myself. The guys at Thrasher helped me put it together. Ah. But it was only meant to be a one-time thing. 
Right. So I printed a lot more than people usually do. And I had shot all these bands from different parts of the country. And, you know, I had access because, you know, again, because like people knew me because of skateboarder or whatever else it was. And, 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 you know, I loved the music. It was my life. So I created these pictures, you know, and, and I think that they told a story that some of the other people didn't quite tell. And, and, you know, my rules, the, the photo zine. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was a, it was a very special thing when it came out. I, this is one of my favorite shots right here, man. I, I really love this shot right here. Okay. I like this shot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's it's, it's, a couple of feet from where Ian's sitting right now. Is, is, is that an oddity that, that that one would resonate so much for me? I mean, it just, you know, you, you know, we learned a long time ago, you guys as musicians probably think the same thing. It's like, you know, you can never tell what people are going to like. You don't That's do right. it because what people are going to like, what people right. see, they're going to see. Is it my favorite photo from the session? No, but it's a yeah. cool shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, and the great, I mean, what's one of the things I love about the book too, is that it just tells the complete story right. of, you know, how I photograph them. You know, for people who haven't seen the book yet, you know, we've got almost every single photo from the salad days. You know, I didn't even shoot a whole roll of film, but that, you know, the iconic shot is, um, you know, is, is what it is. But then I, show people, you know, the rest of the photos that we took on that roll of film. We didn't even finish a whole roll of film, but I, I thought it was kind of fun. And I think, you know, at this point in time, yeah, people really appreciate seeing all the other ones besides this one. It, it was good. It was a good fun day. And we I, got I, I never day. noticed the, um, the prosthetic limbs uh, on the, on the uh, outskirts of this, of this shot. Never noticed that before. Still out there. <laughs> oh no, stop it. No. <laughs> Those those were always there. I mean, I think on the single cover it was cropped square. Yeah. When they put out the, um, I think when we put out the uh, complete discography on the CD, we were able to see the full frame image, and also in the book "Fuck You Heroes" and in my rules, you have the full frame image, really big, right? So you got to see all that. Yeah. Um, another, just another show that you talk about, which was, oh, I'm looking for a shot from there. Is uh, the CBGB? True, I sent you some pictures. That CBGB show is insane. And, and yeah, you know, that's being, a, being it's New York it. hardcore. You know, uh, I'm digging cool. it out. I'm, I got 300. Well, I had to give you some of those. Yeah, I'm digging them out. One's on top of the other. Is on top. Well, of the you other. Say, just show the whole fucking spread. People see it. I can't. I can only do one at a time. Hey, you know, I have a question. I have a question about this one. Is this shot? Is this shot taken in the? sort of homeless shelter next to CBGB's? Ian, would you like to answer that? It's a ho that ho kind of weird hotel joint, yeah. yeah. Right next door, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Absolutely. We just walked upstairs for a moment. I only got one photo, I think, in that stairwell. It's just up a couple steps off of the Bowery. And obviously it was after the show. And yeah, I like that show. I, I, I like that shot. I think it came out pretty cool. Yeah, I, I sort of recognize the, uh, the institutional vibe to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it was a men's shelter, right? Yeah, it was. That's right. Yeah, it was one of the last of the sort of uh, uh, men's shelters on the Bowery, and and here's one of the CBGB shows, which was kind of this was Ian. This was this is looks like utter madness. Look like one of our shows. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. That was that was that show popped off pretty intensely. We were really late getting there. We had trouble with our van, and uh, they were trying to the CBs was trying to like stop the show and the, you know, the kids were trying to keep, you know, keep it going until we, until we showed up and we just had to run in and go right on stage. So it was just right. I mean, it was like, and everyone just flipped. It was a great night. It was a good one or a great yeah, afternoon. Show. It, it, yeah. it really was an incredible show. You know, uh, Drew, I mm -hmm. think, you know, Ian knows this, but I mean, you know, I really love the black flag book and the black flag book is really, really intense. But if, but I think that the difference between the black flag book, it, it does have a certain kind of intensity, but the minor threat book is just chaos. It's absolute chaos, you know, throughout yeah. the whole thing. I mean, just because I think, you know, it's a younger band and just the way Ian was on stage, you know, where we, he felt so much like he was one of us more than any other group at that time. And and plus they were just fantastic, right? That like, we, you've already discussed what great musicians they were and what a great band they were. And, and you know, and it wasn't like they had a hundred songs. It's like they could play every song that they had at the gig. And it's just like, you know, hit after hit after hit. You're just fucking happy and you're singing along with every song. And, and like I said, just utter fucking chaos. And I'm really happy that it just, you know, you see it in this, 
book. I, you know, the reason I sent you this one, uh, Drew, is because if you look at by Lyle, you see like five women behind him, you know, there at the stage, which is, you know, pretty incredible at CBGB's. And then you just see the shot of Jeff Nelson, too, with Lyle to the left. It's like, you know, there weren't that many shots of Jeff like that, at, and particularly at CBGB's. And then, of course, you see Steve, who, you know, short lived in the band, but some pretty uh, heavy duty shots of him. That gives that, I think that gives people a good idea of, you know, the the you know the, the way the book moves yeah absolutely and uh for New those York art. <laughs> cbgb right for those that uh, a couple people are asking uh where they could grab the book here, here this is the back of the book correct you sent me this shot yeah yeah the book uh That's reach re glenn reach out to glenn at uh where did I put? They don't have to reach out to me. They can get it at the book company website. They can get it 25 oh, yeah. discount yeah. signed copy of the book. Would I okay. Okay. Yeah, one? like you said, Johnny Temple, Acacia Books is carrying it. Yep. Then he put it out. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So so there you go. Right on. Good. Um, anything uh, you'd like to add to it, uh, Glenn, as far as the process goes? Or are, are you happy with the with the final product? I, I know you are. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, there's always, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and I think that every book has its issues. But as you get to each one, you hope, and generally there are less and less problems, you know. Um, I think we sent this picture because there's that guy who uh, some people might recognize in the front row singing along with uh, Ian. Pat Dubar. Ah, uniform yeah. choice, yeah. There you go. Actually, in one of the earlier photos, you can see Dave Dichter singing. Oh, wow. There's and you know Big Frank, Big Frank from Zed Record. Do you know who that is? Mm -mm, I don't know. Big Frank, he was Golden Voice for many years. He was yeah, a big, yeah. Uh, he was a oh yeah, Big voice. Frank from Golden Voice. Yeah, Big Frank. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, see, if you go back, the, one of the first photos you showed was at the back of my head. You can see an audience, and Big Frank is right there, and then you see Dave right next to him. Not Dave's this like one. reaching, like looking right towards right. the camera. Not that one. Now it's in, now it's the back. You had the, it's sort of the back of my head. Big Frank. Yeah um yeah. okay good um yes but yeah as you're saying while you're looking for that photo i'll tell you i think this one came out really great i mean they're all great i'm proud of all of them but as we go on we make less and less even little sure. mistakes and i mean with the essays from Guy and from zach and uh and and alec and you know and ian svenonius and Jamie Shanahan, you know, there's just a lot of great essays in this book. I mean, they're Biafra. just- Biafra, don't forget Biafra. Jello Biafra. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, it, it's, it's a, you know, you'll see it. I mean, anyone who sees it's stoked, I'm stoked. It came out, it, it, it's pretty great, I have to say. It, I really got it, you know, getting it fine-tuned there. It's really working on all cylinders, that book. There yeah. it is. You see That's Dave true. reaching yeah. towards the camera. That's Dave from MDC looking straight yeah. at the camera there on the left. Wow. Yeah, and that's Frank. It was a big, the bald guy singing along there. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, they played that night. It was Dead Kennedys, Meyer Threat, MDC, and Zero Boys, and the Detonators. I think that was in in um, uh, was it a barn? Where is it? Alpine Village. Where was that? That was in uh, I think by Hawthorne or somewhere yeah. in Torrance, maybe Torrance, somewhere in Torrance. Torrance. Yeah, Torrance. It's a little yeah. bit south of you know, Los on the you know on the yeah. South Bay is what they call it, right? And Biafra, Biafra was, you know, he was so the Dead Kennedys really were they let they let us open for him a couple of times. They were huge shows, and it was really um they were really supportive. And Biafra was super supportive. Makes sense. Yeah. On the yeah, and, and here it is again. Uh come on. There you go. There it, yeah, South Bay. Yeah, South Bay. Yep. So that's it. You know, I, I think. Yeah, th th this isn't this isn't one of Glenn's shots, but I want I want to ask you about sort of this. Uh, Do you want to cut me off now, Drew? Is that it? No, not, unless you. I, I know you're not feeling great, man. No, no it's okay. I'm just you're just saying I, you're showing another shot. Go ahead. Um, I just, you know, part of what I remember from Minor Threat, uh, I saw Minor Threat a bunch of times, was this whole sort of on stage melee how everybody would get onto the stage. I remember when you played New York Irving Plaza, it was just an incredible amount of people on the stage. Yeah. What, what, what do you attribute that to? No barrier between the band and the audience, right? And, you know, I think that 
it's funny that actually it was it became problematic. It was so yeah. insane. And, you know, we couldn't get through songs sometimes and they would knock over the amps or, you know, um, but I just loved the idea that we were putting on a, sh like we'd go into a venue, but we were having the show. It wasn't their show. Like they may have owned the door and the walls, but we fucking owned the room. And then I say, we, not the band, I'm talking about the band and the audience. We were putting on the show. So like going to Irving Plaza, like, I don't, there's just a room for me. Like I just say that we meaning the band and the audience, like the kids, the kids were going to put on a show. We we're going to do what we do. And that was, um, so the idea of not having any security and letting it and policing ourselves, that was really, that's always appealing to me. But also I really believe that, um, especially at that time that, that we were tough up. We were not, we were not, we were not, um, People were nice. They're they're looking after, yeah. you know. So it wasn't it wasn't a situation where, you know, we were under threat. You know, the, the people coming on stage were, you know. Although ironically, there was a period of time where when my throat toured in '83, especially that you know, actually both tours, but other towns, people would just jump on stage and try to beat me up and stuff. It was pretty. <laughs> that's just part of the deal. <laughs> kind of used yeah. to it. Um, yeah, that's a crazy. The other, the other, where's that? That also. Uh, that's that's Irving Plaza, yeah, and, yeah. and I am three. Uh, there's you, Sprint, yeah. me, yeah. Uh, Bert. Bert is behind me. I'm I'm literally. It's right on stage at uh, that's the infant one of those infamous Irving Plaza. Which shows. one is you? Which one are you? I am. You see, you see where you towards the left. Yeah. And then there's Springer in the white shirt towards yeah. your right. Yeah. I'm right. My elbow, my my, I'm right behind him. Oh, that's you. Okay, all right. Yeah, in front of in front of Bert, yeah. in front of. Yeah, Bert. that was probably that was probably um. That was probably the second time we played. We played with SSD and M, uh, MDC. That would have been in a. What was? Let me see. I can tell you when that was. That was, I think it was in um, Urban Plaza, right? Yeah, it was, uh, was I, November I '82, I think. I think you came through once when Steve was playing bass, and then I think you did the last go round back as a four piece. That's a Gildersleeves. Oh, a yeah. Gildersleeves, yeah. We did the Gildersleeves shows the back as a four piece. Right. But that show was Irvin Plaza with SD and uh, MDC. Yeah, it was a great show. And we played, we we played Irving Plaza. The first time I played in New York was opening Meyer Threat and it was April, no, May, it was early May of um eighty-two, and it was Double O Meyer Threat and the Bad Brain. Yeah, bad Brain at Irving Plaza. Yeah. 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 That was a great one. I was at that one as well. That was great. That was a good one. Um, yeah. And let's see what else. Uh, Glenn, you got what else you got? <laughs> you tell me, man. You ask the questions. You're the yeah, guy. yeah. 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 Oh, there's J there's Jamie right there. Jamie Sharapa from SSD. Yep. Yeah. He says, Yep, minor threat, SSD, MDC at Irving. Yeah. And Paris oh, Mayhew from Jamie? Omax says I was there too. What's that? I said, what up, Jamie? Yeah. Yeah. There, there you go. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Glenn. You're welcome. That's it. Let's uh, go back to the real talk. You guys. Yeah. Do yeah. I, I hope you feel better, buddy. And let's talk Thank soon. You. And okay. let's, get, let's get your son's band on one of our bills down at the Bowery Electric. Okay. That'll all right, happen. buddy. Thank you so much. See you again. Talk to you okay. soon. Bye bye. All right. Glenn Friedman, one of the good guys. So. There you go. Um, let me ask you, I, I want to find a visual for this. Uh, Jerry Frey, March, uh, What's that? 92383. Uh, minor Threat plays with Trouble Funk. And the big boys. At, and the uh, big boys, right? Landsberg, here, yeah. yeah. Here yeah. we go. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Why did it end here? Could you give us a little perspective on that? Well, we had gone back to being a four piece and we, and over the summer we were practicing um, and working on songs and uh, we were just a, we were a, uh, just didn't agree on the direction of the music, honestly. Like, I mm -hmm. think first off we formed the band as kids. So we always argued, we always yeah. argued, argued, argued. That was normal. Um, Every, everybody, this, all four guys. Always oh yeah. We all, yeah, it was all, yeah. <laughs> it was but a there, melee. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah, smart. We are smart asses and and yeah. and uh, defensive and all that. And kind of instigators, stuff. and we got yeah. it all. <laughs> so, um, 
Now, to be clear, we didn't know this would be our last show. There was certainly not a, we didn't know, we didn't go into it knowing it would be our last show. I think probably some of us went into it thinking it might be our last show because we were not getting along. And uh, one of the big dilemmas we had run into was that there was a, a music, a difference in where to go with the music. And I just couldn't deal with the kind of music they were thinking about the stuff they were working on i just couldn't sing to it it didn't appeal to me mm. and i it just wasn't didn't feel right to me and um and we were just yeah we were at odds so we did that show and then we didn't talk for a few weeks and then at the beginning of october i got a note saying that they were going to break up the band so i said well you can't break up without me so we had a meeting and then we broke up when, oh, we when, did go back in and record Salad Days uh, a month after that even. We went back and did Salad Days. Yeah, that was a, one of my questions. Was that actually recorded after? Yeah, the band had broken up. Yeah, but Jeff Jeff Nelson, who, of course, lived here in Discord House with me and is a co-owner of Discord Records. Right. Um, you know, he, you know Jeff, Jeff is a consummate archivist. Like, he really mm. wants stuff saved for posterity. And we had... Salad Days was done. We had performed that song and we'd performed Good Guys um, mm -hmm. and even Stumped. We even did that sort of like a little, that kind of jam. We used to call it Brian's song. And uh, so it was just decided that we would, Jeff said, we got to record those songs because we're, you know, we're, that's the only thing we don't have recorded. We got to go record those. And we kind of, we argued about it because, like, you know, you guys fucking broke up the band. Like, but, but it was finally I agreed I would go record the song. Uh, but I wasn't going to agree to put him out. Um, but anyway, it took, it took a while. It did come out finally in about. It, ca it came later. out like two, two years later, right? Yep. 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 Yeah. But it was, um, but it's funny. I have a, I have a recording of that session where you can hear it's basically the entire session. And at that point, Don had gone to an eight track machine. Mm. And as a result, I could sing live. Mm. So, out of step, for instance, that record, those vocals are live. There's no overdubs. That's all live vocals. Um, and it's just as a uh, thing I, I, I think is interesting. The song Look Back and Laugh on Out of Step, that's the first time I ever sang that song. Oh, Never wow. practiced it with them, ever. I had sung it along with a cassette recording of a practice tape. And so then we would go in and that was our take one. That was the first time I said, stop there. That's what we're, that's all we need right there. That's the one. And uh, <laughs> so then salad days, the vocals are live. So I have this tape where we do, you know, take after take after take after take of salad days. Um, there's probably 12, even because some of them we stop halfway through, but I'm right. singing for keeps every time. Um, and it's pretty fascinating to hear, you know, it's an interesting um, you can tell that even though we had broken up, you know, we were really trying, you know, we're, we're going to do, do well. I think, again, we really were committed to precision and making shit sound good. Yeah. And there's a couple of things on that record. You know, there's some acoustic guitar, there's, some, there, there's some, there's, there's some chimes, right? I mean, there's some different elements, uh, right? Uh, the acoustic guitar was done after the fact, obviously Lyle overdone those. Ooh. Well, that yeah. was Lyle. You know, he overdubbed yeah. that. I, I wasn't crazy about the, I mean, it's, they're fine. Texturally, it's fine in retrospect. Yeah, yeah. At the time, I sort of like, why? You know, um, the chimes, that was Jeff Nelson. He was, he had this idea for the chimes and he, he actually, uh, he, we fought so hard about that because he Ooh. had to rent the chimes. There were $70 or $75 or something like that to rent these three chimes. They're just tubes, by the way. Yeah, There's yeah. like these pipes hanging from a wire. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he rented them. And $75 may not seem like a lot to people, but let me tell you something. Salad days cost $150 to make. So half the fucking money was spent on, on the chimes. chimes. <laughs> um, I'm so mad. Maybe right. I'm being, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was $300 to make, but still, it was all, it's just, but. Anyway, people love the chimes. They're also out of tune, which is I, lis I listened to it today and I thought it, you know, yeah. but but it holds well, a, it it holds a special place in my heart. So it's it's like the early clash stuff, yeah. right? It, it is it is you know. Um, well, you know what I can say about that song is that, um, and all my songs is that um, I meant it and I mean it. 
those lyrics i don't i didn't fuck around my my lyrics are real and i'm and i'm serious Absolutely. so that song it's funny that, that song is me kind of um sort of being kind of dismissive of nostalgia the idea of nostalgia right and 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 sort of and 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 it's ironic because 1983 and i'm talking about punk rockers being like oh man back in the day all this kind of stuff and uh and you know i and it ends it says like it's a fucking lie right because today is the day That's now's right. the time you know That's and right. i don't mind like i have a good memory i'm a person i remember a lot of things i'm i'm i feel i'm glad my like i'm i'm glad to be alive i'm glad to have been alive i like like I, I think it's interesting when people like i love to talk about things if people are interested i can answer questions but i'm not a nostalgic person i'm not i don't not sentimental i don't look back and think well that was one is good you know it, it maybe it was good then but you know it's good now is now you know, I always I, I agree with you 100 percent. And and I'm more, you know, I, when people say the good back in the day or the good times and, and as far as I was, the good times are today. And what's happening is looking down the road from here. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, let's let's look down the road and, and, and let's live in today and let's move move forward. And I, I, I live I live that way uh, as well. One hundred percent. But, you know, I always felt like UDC guys. Right. The D, you know. You you guys really moved off this stuff, you know. You sort of like, I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, or, or give me the proper take on it from your perspective. But I feel like my DC friends, my DC guys, as far as we did this, then we experienced it, we lived it. Today's today, and we're moving forward. Is that a fair take on things? I think so. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure what that what you what it what that encompasses. Well, well, that's, well because because I don't feel like there's there's no there's not a lot of reunions. There's not a lot of let's go back and do remember this. You know, let let no. let's get this band back together. DC doesn't. Pardon the expression. DC doesn't fuck with any of that. DC. A lot of the DC musicians are constantly recreating and 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 moving forward. I suppose that's true. I don't know. It's weird. I mean, there's some, you know, some bands occasionally get together and play. I mean, Soul Side got back together and played and um, Scream still, still play, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, although Scream, they're, they're a different animal. I mean, Scream yeah. Team, love those guys, that. that's that's family. That's a really love, deep. Love, love that new Scream record, by the way. That's a good record. Man, that, that, was an incredible, great, great record. that was an incredible session. My God. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, strange to think that I've known 1980 and, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I will say that, I mean, DC is, the thing about DC is that, like, this is not an entertainment town. Like, DC, the, the, the economic canopy of this town is really the federal government. Yeah. And um, as a result, the, there's no, the industry, you can't really, it's hard to be, like in New York or LA or other towns, you have, like, you could be in band, you could actually get a, kind of have a kind of a living, whatever. It's not really the case here. It's not. It doesn't work that way here. Um, so what you have in D.C. and places like D.C. is you have ideas, and you might even have movements. Yeah. But then the movements eventually will go somewhere else where they can be sold. Like that's where they become the thing. Um, and uh, so over the years, if you look at in the, in the cultural world in Washington, you'll find there's a really like there was a huge bluegrass scene here in the '60s. There was. Um, there was a, a art movement called the color school that came out of here. There's great, there's a really powerful uh, theater, like sort of action stuff that goes on in Washington, but they, it just not, it's not a sustainable thing. Like you're not going to, it's not like people can just have, like go do that thing. But I think in other towns, it's a little more of a, a bit more in the job. So people can do that. They can kind of go back. And I'm not, I have to say there was a period of time where I, I was a little puzzled and then a little put off by uh, the re the band reforming mm. but at some point i thought you know they're the people are like it's like they're like why not it brings people joy and it's fine that's with right. me i have no i'm not mad about it at all i wouldn't like for me my threat will never play a show that's just not because my threat belong to that moment right it. And, it, and 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 for me that's you know my threat like when we didn't agree 
on what the band was going to do. We didn't agree. That's when we pulled the plug. We didn't do that weird other record. Yeah. Like there isn't that weird record that shouldn't, they shouldn't have done, you know, or, you know, that we, and we didn't try to do a Hail Mary of any sort. We just pulled the plug and said, that's that. Mm -hmm. Now go do what you're going to do. And, you know, and then obviously I went on to embrace and, um, and then later on that led to Fugazi, Mm -hmm. but it's all, to me, it's all one thing. It's all the same. It's coming from the same place. I'm responding to the environment that's around me. Makes sense. Yeah. So, so it was the form, like, my, I did one, I did some, an interview and one thing where people, you know, people say like, well, you know, you left hardcore. I'm like, yeah, fuck that hardcore left me, you know, like it just did its thing. It, it became like a form. But for me, the whole, the form was a thing to break. That yeah. was the point. And I don't, and I'm not, again, I'm not judgmental. I don't, I'm, I, I look at, I don't, I don't look at other bands or other scenes and think like, you know, well, those guys are, you know, they don't know what they're doing. I, I think they're doing what they want to do. And that's great. I got no issues with it whatsoever, but I'm still, I'm a, I'm a fucking weirdo. I do what I do. <laughs> gotcha. You know. la- la- last minor threat, la- last minor threat sort of related question. We'll take a couple questions from around the world and then we'll wrap it up. Who came, ac- who did, who rediscovered this? H- how did this come? Was this something that was, forgotten about uh, that like how did t- this, i can tell you exactly how, how did this how did this pop back up after all these years i mean i can tell you straight up I, i'm the one who did it uh okay please when we record out of step as i said we record all the vocals are live um and we record and there was a lot of going into the recording there was a lot of arguing within the band about what was going to be on this record we had seven new songs which was not enough. It was too much for a seven inch and not really enough for an album. Right. Right. And that was a big, so we had a big debate about what we were going to do. Like we wanted sure. to record. We had the five, it was a five piece, you know, Steve was playing bass and, and Brian was on guitar and it was a really like, it was a new sound. And, and, and there was a, we had a sense we should go record these songs, but how would we release them? And there was a, um, a discussion within the band about should we re-record the early songs, which I was against because it seemed like a ripoff, you know, mm. just making people buy the songs again. Sure. Um, then Jeff and I had, we had actually proposed doing the album. One side would be new songs and the B side would be the two singles, which Lyle and Brian rejected because they didn't want to have like a, you know, side A, side B thing. They didn't want to have that happening. Um, so we finally went to record the emphasis was really on these seven new songs. Um, and then we had this song cashing in, which was a joke song. It was a song we did one time. Um, our first show, we reformed here in DC, our kind of scene. There was a lot of yeah people who were like accusing us of selling out. I actually, I, rem- was, I remember this. Yeah. Right. I mean, which I thought was back for the money. Right. Which is absurd. I mean, there was no <laughs> money at all. And right. so we did a song sort of, a joke song and I, you know, about how we're doing it for the money and, uh, and, you know, just being facetious. And we did it one time at opening for the bad brains, April 29th, 1982, our first show back together. And, uh, and, um, so, but the band, like, especially Jeff loved the song and he really wanted to record it. And I was, this is typical. I'm like, uh, you know, okay, I'll record it, but we're not going to put it on the record. Well, anyway, obviously, it's, but it ended up being on the record, but not listed, right? right. It was right. a secret track, right. and uh, initially it was on the vinyl. And then we, there was also this big discussion about the song "Out of Step," which was on the single. And there was a lot of controversy about that song because people heard those lyrics as charges or commands or directives: "Don't smoke, don't drink, don't fuck." Um, now I wrote the words and I knew that the fourth line was at least I can fucking think. So clearly those first three things were me like talking about myself. I don't do this. I don't do this. I don't do this, but at least I can fucking think, mm-hmm. you know, I'm out of step of the world. Um, but there was a lot of discussion and controversy within, even within the band about who, whether I was telling people what to do or not. So it was decided that we would do redo the song and that I would, um, 
we would put some language in the music, the sort of instrumental break to clarify that, um, which we did. Um, although it was very hard to do, uh, it was really hard to do it. And then Jeff was giving me so many instructions that he finally came in. I was standing by the mic, and he came in to tell me, you know, what he what he wanted. We got into an argument. And Don re hit record, and and some of which, and that actually ended up in the record is me yeah. and Jeff arguing yeah. about what the fuck I'm supposed to be singing. As it turned out, at the end of that session, like we had extra tape. I don't, I didn't remember any of this, but we recorded in my eyes, and we recorded filler, and we recorded an instrumental called Adam's Family, which as 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 a five piece now, which as a five piece, right? Yeah. So, but. We never mix those songs. I see. Uh, the Adams Family thing, we did use that, and we mixed it in the end of cashing in, like the coda. So yeah, we kind of did a fades bridge. In, it fades right, back. It fades out of it, right. So Don Zintero was in this, you know, he had moved from the basement to this bigger building for 30 years, and then he got kicked out of the building by the county. Um, they took over the building. And so he was, in the waning months of that of that time, you know, I was trying to get as much stuff transferred off the of tape as I could because he had the studio and he had Tim tape machines. Sure. He's, he no longer has tape machines. Right. So I brought the, I borrowed an eight track from somebody, an eight track machine. And I brought, and I thought I should just back up out of step. I should do that. So I brought it out and we strung it up and I looked at the track listing and I saw in my eyes and filler and I thought it must be a joke because I don't I had no recollection of recording it whatsoever. But I, it wasn't a joke. It was there. So I just mixed it with Don and I sent it to Lyle and Brian and Jeff. And I said, do you remember this? And none of them remembered it. The only wow. person who remembered it was Steve Hanskin. He did remember it because wow. Steve can remember, he remembers everything. That's but um, but not, totally shocked that to find it and kind of cool versions. Yes. So they just sort so I they were just sort of sitting there. And then last year, about uh, in December of uh, 22, I was thinking about it. I said, you know what? We should put out a single with those songs. Just kind of think people would get a kick out of hearing these things. And um, that's what happened. It's great. It was uh, quite a surprise. Yeah. And, and it does. It sounds great. And it's, it's, it's great to hear a couple of those songs with Steve as a five piece. Yeah, for sure. It was cool sounding. You know, and I just want to say this for, just for the record that I didn't come on the show to promote this record. No, we know that. Yeah, I yeah. want to. I just want to. I want to be clear yeah. that, like, so too many times I see people being interviewed on on yeah. podcasts or anything, and there's always a product. I got nothing to sell. I'm not yeah. here to sell anything, and I just want to be clear about that. I don't like. I'm happy to answer questions about it, but I didn't. Yeah. I'm not here on behalf of that single. I wouldn't even think about it single till you put that picture up. I'm just thinking about what you're asking me. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, we know you, and we assume that yes. But yeah, it's good. It's good to lay it out. How about we take a, a just a couple? I know you're a busy guy. Let Let's take a couple questions from around the world. Um, uh, Stefan asks, "Hey, Ian, how is working with John Fushante of the Chili Peppers? He seems like a down to earth gentleman. That DC EP rocks." Oh, I like that record too. John's and John and I are friends. We've known each other for many years. He's a consummate musician. He's a brilliant beyond brilliant guitar player. And he was at the time he had, he was working on solo things and he asked me, we were talking and he said, you know, I said, if you want to come out, we can record it in her ear. So he came out to Washington and Jerry Busher, who um, was in Fidelity Jones, but also um, was sort of the Fugazi's fifth member. He was the second drummer in Fugazi. Mm -hmm. Jerry's a really close friend and a great drummer. So he and John started, you know, they practiced together and we went to the studio. It was great. John is, again, like, he's such a brilliant musician and really, he knows exactly what he wants and, how, yeah. and everything was layered. So, yeah, it was it was great. And he's, and he's a, a lovely person. Yeah. Personal question a bit. You know, you, you've you you've been involved. You, you've produced, per se, uh, you know, quite a few bands, including Scream and Seven Seconds, of course, going back Government Issue and Bikini Kill. What 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 does it mean when when Ian McKay produces your record? Do you get involved with the songwriting? Like like what does that what does that look like? And, and and what what attracts you to a project? I think that for me, when I, when I said you know, produ being producing a, a 
a record or, or a tape is really, um, it's nebulous. Uh, but um, for me, it's really the opportunity to kind of be a, a member of the band. Mm. Recording is, can, I think, is a really kind of a, a very intense and kind of personal like sort of experience. Like you're really, you're putting down on, you're recording for posterity what will likely be the definitive versions of those songs by other people's standards, not definitive in reality. You know, people, for instance, the song Waiting Room, you know, people, for most people, the definitive version of Waiting Room was the one that's on the record. Right. But I played that song a thousand times or more. And I can guarantee you there were other versions of that song over the years right. that were more transcendent, you know, that's, but that's, but for the record, it's literally for the record. That's the version that people are going to mostly know. So sure. when I go into the, it depends. I mean, I think usually I go in as really a member of the band as sort of an, as a, um, a translator or an interpreter. So it's like the recording process can be very daunting or confusing. Um, and when you go into a studio, there's all these machines and this weird setting and it's like a laboratory kind of, and you're suddenly, and I'm just there to try to help, um, explain how things work and just put people at ease, but also to maybe make suggestions if they're stuck mm. on something or maybe, maybe I'm, I don't write, so I don't rewrite their songs. I don't write right. my thing. I'm not into that at all. Sure, sure. But mostly I just try to help them sound like the way they want to sound. That's the main thing is try to get, make a record that sounds good to them. And uh, it's weird. I've done, I, I think I've produced, I have no idea how many records I've produced. I would say, at least a hundred, but I don't know a lot. Sure. Um, and, uh, and here's a, just a, give you a slight insight. I've only been paid for one session ever. I've never wow. charged anybody ever. I don't, it's not a job for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the only time I ever got paid was with this excellent band from Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania called, uh, follow fashion monkeys. And in 1985, they came down, I think it's 85, might have been 84, but they came down and they called and they said, we're recording it in her ear. Would you be willing to come over and hang out with us in the studio? And I went over and I didn't really know them, but they're nice people and they had really cool songs. And we, I spent two days with them recording. And then at the end of it, they said, well, we feel we should pay you. I said, no, I don't, I don't want any money. And they, they gave me 50 bucks. And I took him out to dinner. So, um, but it was it's a great so, it's so recipient. Yeah, it yeah, it was, it was, oh, I love and that tape came out great. Uh, yeah. Follow Fashion Monkey. They, I think the only song that ever came out officially was on a, um, there was a comp out of Pennsylvania, like a punk, hardcore kind of punk four song EP. I forget what it's called now. Um, maybe a song called Menagerie, which mm. is a great song. Um, but I really, I've never been paid. I like I did that scream thing. I worked, I worked for so long that scream record, but I always think of it as, um, well, I always, my thing is work for free and get paid for nothing. Mm. Like if I do something, I better want to do it. And then I get paid. I'm like, Oh, that's for what? I loved what I would love to be here. That's all. I'm happy to be here. And so I, you know, my, I always work. I'm always working all the time. Um, it just doesn't, yeah, it just, it just seems like something to do. And I like it like that. So yeah. producing, but, you know, I don't do a lot of producing now. It's hard in the ears. Um, but I don't do a lot. I just did a session with my sister's band, Bedmaker. Yeah, you mentioned that. You mentioned That's that. great. I did my brother's band, Hammered Holes. That record came out. I, I was about time. to say, uh, do yeah. you enjoy working with your brother? Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. It's my brother. <laughs> you go. Mackay, Mackay are tight, you know. Yeah. Um, Always have been, it seems. And, yeah, and uh, and then a band, Center Ghost. I did some stuff with them. I do just mostly local stuff. I don't. I'm not a gun for hire. Like I've yeah. never, I've never like gone. The only time I've ever gone out of town to record a band, I did twice. I think. And I'm thinking one was um, I went to. Uh, Lansing, Michigan, to make the first the um, the IQ thirty two seven inch with the Necros. I went there to record. I recorded it there and mixed it with Don um, here. And then the only other time is I went to Leeds in nineteen eighty seven. I think it was to record Henry's uh, Lifetime record. 
And that's my only time really out of like doing stuff outside of Washington. Uh oh, you're gone. Can somebody, is anybody hearing me now? Or is it just me or are we off now? Hmm. Alas. Well, let's, let's contemplate. Drink some tea. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. That was odd. Sorry. It so was- anyway, I was going to say the only other time that I went out of town was I went to Leeds to record Henry's lifetime record. Mm-hmm. Um, and Henry flew me out there. So I guess he paid me for paying that way. But um, that was a great session, too. I, I, I have a personal one for you. I, I, any unsung heroes from those from the from the early um, DC days? Any anybody that maybe through the shifting sands of time, you know, might not have been known or recognized, or and, and any unsung heroes from those early days in, in DC? In terms of what? Just in terms of uh, contribution, per, personality, influence, anything like that. I mean, the scene Washington was filled with people like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, Kim Kane from the Slicky oh, Boys. I wanted to mention the Slicky yeah. Boys. The Everybody Slicky that Boys. comes on the show from DC yeah. mentions the Slicky Boys. Yeah, I mean, uh, Howard Wolfing and the nurses. Howard's yeah. really, he was really interesting. Skip Groff from yesterday and today was hugely important mm. for us. Um, the enzymes, trench mouth, uh, uh, there's all these like pre punk, like slightly before us kind of bands. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's record store guys and, and obviously Dodie Bowers who ran the nine thirty club. She was the one that, you know, we were, if the nine thirty club opened in May of 1980, they adopted, um, they were not all ages and, mm. Um, they, we had a bunch of us punks had been banned from this club called DC space. Sure. Um, it was, a, it was bullshit. Um, an older drunk punk guy ripped a urinal off the wall, but they blamed all of us. Um, but think about DC punks is that we didn't do vandalism and we didn't do graffiti. Like we were, again, we were tough guys, but we were not, we weren't idiots. So we weren't just doing yeah. stupid shit. But we got tagged for that. We got and we were banned from that club. And so when 930 opened, they they basically we were on the we were on the band list like right away, all the punk kids. And um we talked them into letting us come in. I started I saw the bad brains there in I think it was July of eighty. And um so I just got to know them and eventually I think they realized that there was something really cooking with our scene. Mm-hmm. We were doing these big shows. And mm-hmm. um, I went and had a meeting with Dodie. And uh, a bunch of us went down there and we said, listen, uh, we're kids. And and I was at that point, I was 18, but mm-hmm. my brother was 14 or 15 and everyone was all these little wow. kids. So we're like, we're kids. And we love music and we, we need to see these bands. Um, so we want to figure out, we want to work out a way with you to get us into these shows. We want these shows to be all ages. And we had through the help of other, um, older, like more knowledgeable people, they told us about this thing in DC called the, there's a popcorn law. And the popcorn law is that, um, if you serve, if you're a, um, well, first off, there's, if you're a bar, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You Nobody under the age of 18 was allowed in, period, end. But in D.C., if you serve alcohol, you have to serve a certain amount of food. That's the popcorn law. Yes, That's why okay. you have popcorn, because you have to have some kind of food. Like finger finger food right. or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But technically, that means that they're, not, they're licensed as restaurants. That's right. So restaurants can be all ages. I know where this is going. Right. Yeah. So we, were, we went down and said, hey. Like you're a restaurant. So technically you could let us in, but you have decided it's too risky for your liquor license. To, if the kids come in here and drink, right. we are not going to drink. We just want to see the shows and we will police ourselves. Right. 
And we, in the Mabuhay Gardens, when we got to San Francisco, the uh, Teen Idols, Dirk Dirksen was letting underage people in with a little X on the back of his hand. Exactly. Boom. Right. So we saw Boom. this. We came to do it. He said, we will put the X on the back of our hand. And that'll show you that we're underage. And even those of us who are old enough to drink, we will put the X on our hand to show you that we're in, we are right. in, um, um, in concert with them we're gonna we're, we we support this movement we want we right. think kids should be able to see live music um right. which was really the, what the x's were all about was about access to music and and freedom mm -hmm. uh, and uh and the um and she she agreed Dodie bowers she she agreed to it and yes. 9 30 to this day even though Dodie long since sold the place and has moved to a different location is still all ages and all ages shows in DC, the Black Cat, DC Nine, um, Comet Ping Pong, like all these places that do gigs, all ages, and it's really because of this sort of the kids are stubborn, um, but also because Dodie gave it, she gave it a shot. Certainly an unsung hero. That's exactly what I was talking about. Someone mm -hmm. who's might not be familiar with that name, and 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 there you go. Um, Danny Cole says, uh, I was listening to Embrace. On the way to work today, I have a question. If this gets if this gets read, it just got read. I was curious uh, how Egg Hunt came to be, and I just want to say, uh, doing my homework, uh, Embrace really is sort of the sleeper in 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 your catalog. I really really enjoyed revisiting this band. Embrace is interesting. It is definitely well, not the it's not the total sleeper, but the, the thing about Embrace is people who like Embrace they really like Embrace. Like it's a, for them, and I get it. There's a lot of bands that we also that I love that most people are like what like, but for me there's there's a lot of really small bands that I think are really important bands, and I really appreciate people's um, that that they like this band. And again, these this is a band that. Like this, these lyrics are very serious for me. I was, mm -hmm. I meant it and I mean it. Um, uh, and to answer his question, Embrace was a fraught band. Um, and just to give you a quick idea of how it came about, when Meyer Threat broke up, um, Jeff and I were like, well, what are we going to do now? Maybe we'll form another band. And there was a pressure. Everyone was trying to form new bands. And mm -hmm. so I initially was going to play bass with Mike Hampton from SOA. Uh, and Faith on guitar, and Mark Sullivan was going to sing. Um, but then it, it just wasn't working, and Mike and Mark weren't getting along. So then I moved to guitar, and Chris Bald, who was in Faith, mm. started playing bass, and Jeff was on drums, and Mark was going to sing. But that didn't work. And then at some point, Mark said, Mark was like, you know what? I have a friend of mine just came back from, he just came down from college. Uh, his They went to college together, and we want to do this band, and that band became King Face. That was mm. that was that was the band King Face. So then, I was it was like a three piece. Either I was playing bass um, with Mike on guitar, or I was playing guitar with Chris on bass and Jeff Nelson drumming. Um, at some point, it was decided that I would just sing, and Chris would play bass, Mike would play guitar, Jeff would drum, and that <laughs> would be the new band. But then Jeff and I got into an argument about something about the money or whatever about the how we the band guy have, like for me he was always like fuck money i don't want to think about it i had all these ideas i want to do shows i want to do benefit shows i want to do outdoor shows i want to do all this stuff and jeff was sort of like well and i thought you know what probably best if we don't try to do another band together so now we needed a drummer and it just so happened that ivor hansen who was also in the faith with chris and mike That's had right. just come home from vassar he lived here so we asked if he wanted to drum with us. And then suddenly I was singing for the faith, which is my brother's band. My right, brother, right, brother Alex right. sang for him. So it was a really weird turn of events. Um, but those guys had already been in a band and already fought and broken up. So they knew that they knew exactly how to break up quick. And right. we only played 11 <laughs> shows. We only played 11 shows. Uh, and it was a bit of a, I think the songs are really cool, um, but it just was, it never really, it just, we didn't get along at all. And, um, and uh, so then in the March of 86, um, actually um, we were getting ready. Jeff and I had to go to England to go out to visit Southern studios. They were a, a, a record company 
our um, a, it was a studio and a record company that Discord partnered with, and we pressed records through them, which is so a lot to explain. But I'm not going to. So I will. I'll just say that we went to England to go visit this. We stayed at this place, Stern Studios, and um, right before I left, uh, I booked a show for Embrace in Boston. Mm. We're going to play a show in Boston. And good old, think, good old, good right, old Boston. Right. So Jeff and I. I think we were supposed to come back from England on a Tuesday and the show in Boston was booked for Friday. So before I left, we're going to be gone for three weeks or maybe a month. I don't remember. I told those other guys in the band embrace. I said, you have to practice. Okay. So we're playing as soon as I get home. I can do, I can sing. Don't worry about me, but you got to practice. Um, so then Jeff and I went off to England and we were staying at this house with a studio. It's a 24 track studio. And John Loder, who ran the place, you know, we, he said, do you want to do some recording? And we said, yeah, we, Jeff and I had this, this jam we've been playing forever. Um, and so we just got, we got some equipment and we recorded the me and you song. Um, and then I had a song, which I had shown to embrace and they didn't like it, which was a B side, which is we all fall down. And, uh, so I played bass and guitar on it and Jeff drummed and we made those two songs. Uh, it wasn't, we, we recorded it around Easter, hence egg right. hunt. Egg That's, hunt. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. It was never a band. Um, well, it was not at the time. It was just a studio project. Cause I was still in brace. I got back from the tour. I saw those guys. They hadn't practiced at all. Broke up right then and there. Yeah. That was into that because it's, and, yeah, it's crazy. And, and th this, this, uh, egg hunt recording this was the last time you recorded uh anything with jeff correct i suppose it is yeah yeah i mean we did i mean ironically um <laughs> well nobody knows about this at least I, most people don't know well, is there that you go. embrace broke up and then we were trying to figure out what to do so jeff and i said like well maybe we should do egg hunt as a band so we got we started playing with Jeff Turner and Steve Niles, guys from the Gray Matter. Mm -hmm. And we formed what was going to be called Egg Hunt, the band. Um, we started to practice. And Jeff Turner had written some songs, and I had a bunch of new songs I was writing. Um, and very quickly, I realized, oh, no, no. Note to self, can't be in a band with Jeff Nelson again. <laughs> so I left and they got Mark Haggerty and they became three. Right? That was three. And the songs that Jeff Turner had written were three songs. Wow. And the songs I had written in Defense of Humans, they were Fugazi songs. There was the beginning of my of the Fugazi stuff. Like I I have tapes of that band playing those songs. Fantastic. Um, you know, no words, just music. So it was, but that's the way DC, DC was very, we were all moving yeah. around each other and, um, and we all practice here at Discord house. So it was pretty easy. Yeah. You know, that, that, and like I said, in the pre-show, we were talking, I remember when I came down in <clears throat> 82, um, you know, we, we stopped by and, uh, you guys were rehearsing in the basement. You know, you know what memory I have? Did were you were you working in a movie theater? You yeah, George Usher. Usher. George you were, movie theater. Yeah, I remember we went to a theater and you were an usher in this theater. Yeah, the red jacket. Yeah, George Hamu, thirteen fifty one Wisconsin Avenue. <laughs> yeah, George and, and Gus Heon, uh, my boss Gus, his his actually only surviving sibling from that family just died the other day. Becky uh -huh. Heon, um, the Heons were Greek a Greek family. They uh -huh. they were super George old school Georgetown like tough tough guys yeah, yeah, and yeah. and uh george on theater well that was a theater that showed caligula for like six years oh is that is it the key theater dana george yeah. no george on danny ingram worked at the key theater okay key theaters where they showed rocky horror picture show that was down the street that was like three blocks down i think i remember this i think caligula was playing yeah of course i, I, I think it, it was it was yeah. in that theater for yeah. yeah it was one of those for deals. years and years yeah yeah that that's yeah. Yeah, we worked at Hagen Dazs and we worked at the Georgetown Movie Theater. When you guys came in 82, you came down with SSD that time? We came down with SSD. Yeah. Uh, I came down, we, we sort of caravaned down right. for, for the show that was at the Chancery. 
that oh that yeah that show yeah 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 an issue iron yeah. cross ssd right who else was on was oh faith I, on that faith on that bill i think they might have been let me, let yeah. me I'll, I'll pull the flyer yeah yeah but those, yeah so that show yeah so those at that time i think i was still i might have still been driving the newspaper truck too i was driving oh. for the washington post i would go up like one or two nights a week delivering bundles going at leave at two in the morning and drive a truck all night that's a good gig I loved it. Yeah, I loved oh, yeah, it. Yeah, I love I, I love jobs like Although that. Although I must say that I saw um on Saturday nights, because the Sunday paper was so much thicker and you had to deliver you had to, to pick it up earlier. So usually you have to go to the, the um printing plant at like say two thirty in the morning or three in the morning. But on Sunday nights you had to be there at eleven thirty. And there was two shows. One was that I recall um there was the Ruts DC. Mm -hmm. They played. I had to leave before the show was over to go to work. And the other one was the birthday party. Wow. I had to leave before the show was over. I had to get out to Springfield, Virginia, to the printing plant and pick up the, the bundles and get to work. Yeah, I always love jobs like that. Yeah. Um, Nancy Burrell says the Chancery anniversary is February 20th, which is oh, all right. 42 years. Yeah. Respect and love to Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. She's Nancy and Al. Yep. yep. Nancy. Nancy. Any. Um, I know Boston kind of held a, a, a special uh, place in, in, in your heart and a lot of the DC guys. Um, any, any memories, any fond memories of sort of coming up to Boston or whether it was, I know you played the gallery East. I know, you know what I have, well, this is, where is this? Oh, this is a great we played gallery East. We played at the VFW got, hall in Cambridge yeah, I got and, it, we, right and here. we played in the channel. Here you go. Yeah. There you go. Oh yeah. That's, that's yeah. the VFW melee. Yeah. Uh, that was that. I think that was the most crowded show I've ever been to in my life. That was uh, Martha SSD Meatman and Necros. Necros I think yeah. maybe did Negro Approach play that too? I don't, I'm I don't not sure if they did that. or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those are good. Who took that show? Is that a that's film? that's filling that's filling film flash. flash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are. Um, yeah. Boston would did they, they, they were a friend. I mean, here's the thing, like. I was interested in the kids. So mm -hmm. like I was a kid and coming into the DC scene, there were older punks, some of whom were, and maybe uh, quite a few of whom were very supportive and nice. They didn't quite understand what the hell we were up to. They didn't get us. They thought we were sort of like, try, we are stuck in, they kept saying like, you know, punk is dead or you're, you're, you're stuck in London or something, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. They were dismissive because they were, but they were older people. They were like, and a lot of them were art, school people and they just didn't understand what the fuck we were on about like you know because mm -hmm. we were all these like super energetic super like sort of clear like, we didn't use drugs we didn't drink we were really like we just wanted to have gigs and mm -hmm. we wanted to we wanted to do our thing and mm -hmm. um so i realized that that was something that I, or you could see in almost every town there's like this older crew and then there's these kids coming in. That's and, right. And so for me, there was like, yeah, sure. Like, like meeting, like Al Burrell and I started writing to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, started a friendship that it's till this day. We're still in touch, you know, same with Glenn, like Glenn's one of my best friends, you know, and, mm. and, uh, and Kevin seconds is somebody who I really, he's really dear, you know, dear to me. And all and, these people, like these scenes, there's like these kids and all these scenes who are my, you know, my peers, um, and in and New York, you know, all those like those early days, like the kids were like the first time I came to New York, I remember well, not the first time we came to see Black Flag, and that's where I met Jesse, you know, and 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 you know the heart attack guys and all that, and it was and and and, and of course met Harley early on when he's in the, still in the stimulators, and there was the, there was the kids, those were our people, so we felt a real connection with all those like all those guys, you know. You know rabies or you know or Vinny or ernie from token entry and yeah, yeah. You know, louie and all those like that crew jack all the the mob guys and yeah yeah we felt a real affinity with all it just made us happy to know that, that we got people um and all these every city there was other kids like us and so yeah the boston boston was great going up there although i do remember the um going up there the first time the gallery east and actually, this is funny. This is that was eighty two. Yeah, this is the first tour that we made across the country. And if you look at the um, the routing of that tour, 
really gives you a sense of the way um, <laughs> the way we thought of America. Um, Boston, Lansing, <laughs> Detroit, right? Reno, Reno. Yeah, right. just flew flew over. Pat, we were mad at Chicago because of the. We've been there in '81, and we had a weird show at O'Banions, and it wasn't all ages. And we're like, it was not all age. Like, I don't play shows that aren't all ages. That's just right. for real to this right. day. Sure. Yeah, I think shows that are not all ages are, are just the wrong. Straight yep. up, it's just wrong. Uh, it's for music for all people. Um, yep. And if you're doing, and if it's just shows not all ages, then it's really it's a show. For an in, another industry, it's for the alcohol industry. That's it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, so we went right to Reno, and then we played Reno, and we played like San Francisco, and um, maybe we did Fresno and L.A., San Diego, and then we did Austin, and then we came home, or no, Austin and Houston, <laughs> and then we came home. That's all we knew. We did. It was like those are the only islands we knew, but we knew kids basically or people in each of those towns that kind of were our people. Then the next year, you know, we, of course we were learning a lot from black flag. Cause those guys would just go yeah. play, 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 play. They get back to LA and they'd go right back out and play every other city that they didn't play the first time. Right. They really were the trailblazers in sort of yeah. density getting out there and playing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, and that's where we Fugazi got our shit. Like we played so much because the idea was just go play, like play as much as you can. Here's a, I don't know if this has ever been seen. This is a, a Gallery East minor threat shot. Uh, oh, yeah, the, I think I've seen that. That's, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember it's a woman who took these photos. She had a light uh, bleed in her in her uh, camera. Yeah. Those are amazing. Yeah, those are really yeah. cool, some, cool some, shots. You, you know, one thing I, I in doing my homework, I did, you know, Fagazi really got out there and, and grinded as far as um, touring goes. I don't know if you remember, but when I was out with biohazard in Europe at one point, we, we stopped by and, and saw you and we spoke backstage. It might've been Sweden or something like we, we, we crossed paths and, and yeah. but, but the, I can't, I think I went back with Evan Seinfeld from biohazard. I was like, Fogazi's playing. Let's go, you know? And, uh, but looking at, at, at uh, your sort of, uh, the history, Fogazi was a band that really went out there and, 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 and did work on the road. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was the gift, man. Go play. Yeah. You know, we played, we played as much as we could and we really, and we had, you know, we were really, if people wanted to see us, if we, if we want, you know, if you want to do a show in Missoula, Montana, yeah, and they, there's enough people to pay for our gas to get us down the road. We're going, we'll do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. amazing. Uh, one, one of your projects that I very much enjoyed was the evens. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, uh, it, it came back to it a couple of times. Uh, what what drew you to playing a baritone guitar? I didn't have a bass in the band, mm. so when Amy and I started to play together, you know, Amy like <clears throat> Fugazi in the early two thousands. Well, starting in ninety seven. You know, Brendan's first kid was born in ninety seven, mm -hmm. and so when somebody had a kid the policy of the band was like no horizon. Like you, we stop and there's no horizon. We didn't want them to be any pressure mm. for them to feel like we have to go back on the road or we have to go do something. We want them to fully experience, went Brendan to fully experience whatever, whatever it took. We didn't know what it was going to be. So, and it took some months and then he's like, okay, I'm ready to get back to work. Um, and then he had a second kid and we took a break and, um, and then Joe and Antonia, um, they were, I think they, they were have they were about to have a kid, and we've been taking a lot of breaks. Also, some of our parents were getting sick, and people were dying, and it was a little maddening to be in a to not play music. And Amy was a very old friend of mine and somebody who I really trusted, and I didn't ever play music with people because, and every time I try to play music with someone, they just want to form a band. Mm. Right. It's like a little, it gets too serious too quick. Mm. Um, but she was somebody who just was a, somebody who I really loved and that we were, we'd known each other for a decade at that point. And we just started playing music together and, and with no, there was no plan to be a band. And then also, I should point out the Fugazi for the, we practiced for a year 
And I kept saying to Joe, like, we're not, we're just playing music. We're not forming a band. Mm. And even when we asked Brent if he wanted to play, I said, we're not forming a band. We're just playing music. Do you want to play with us? Um, try to remove, just be in the moment, like not think mm. about what we're working towards, sure. but this is what we're working on. And sure. um, so uh, Amy and I just played and played and played. We just made tapes and it was really, um, it was nice. And I, originally I was playing guitar, which I tried tuning it down and mm. I was just trying into a lower register. Good. We didn't, I don't want to get into a bass. There was no bass player. And eventually uh, this guy, Jesse Quitzlin, I think had said, you should try a baritone guitar. Mm. And I realized that I actually owned one, which was funny. <laughs> I had bought, I was gone to this little guitar shop, not far from here. And they had this baritone guitar. And the guy said, um, I go, what is it? And he was like, well, it's like a lower register guitar. It was, yeah. it was invented. He said it was invented for surf music, but really the only, the only um, place it really was successfully used was on the Morricone soundtrack stuff, the good, bad, and the ugly. If you like sure. that kind of yeah, stuff on yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the spaghetti Western things. And so I bought it. I bought this baritone from him and I took it to a Fugazi practice and it was, useless like playing it through a marshal just sounded like a mess and so i just didn't i i liked it around the house unplugged but i never thought about it as an instrument when i started playing with amy but then i realized we're playing quieter and it's not distorted and then i was like oh yeah this is actually this is the instrument and it's not and the thing about a baritone it's not a it's not a guitar there's no sustain it's like a banjo almost like you really have to keep pedaling otherwise and it's, you it's like a weird tuning is it are you tuned b to b like i am b to b yeah it's b to b right you can also yeah, tune, yeah. i think you could tune a to a also but. yeah it's designed for a to a by yeah. tune b to b yeah i right liked on. it a little it's i think also just for my voice it just was nicer yeah you know i sing a lot of higher register stuff so when it's i got it tuned down a little bit my my compliment would be I really like when the both of you sing together. It's yeah. really it's really nice. I like it. She got a great voice. She, yeah, she does. Yeah. She, she she really does. Hey, so so that said, I know you're a busy guy, uh, you know, and and I appreciate your time. I I, I, don't, I don't. I guess wanna... we. I'm sorry to go so. Um, you know, the thing if you ask me a question, I'm going to answer it. No, no hey, and, and I have a lot. And the thing is, if you ask me, I'm going to like I I can talk at length about many things. Um, it's all going on up here. And, um, you know, when I do, I used to do, uh, these sort of public interviews. I used to just go, they're like Q and a sessions, just oh. open to people. And I liked them because then people could ask the question. They, I, I appreciate your format where people get to ask questions. Um, I like, I'm open to being asked anything really. I don't care. I'll, you know, and the thing about well, me is that either I, I'll, I can answer it or I'm not going to answer it. I don't mind saying I'm not going to answer that question. Um, yeah. but I don't, you know, I know there's probably a lot to, to discuss as always, like, you know, I mean, but, um, I did the best I could on your behalf. And I, I know you did. And I appreciate yeah. it. You know what? I think we'd be admiss because, uh, you know, in, in, in my notes, you know, in my notes that, that, that I didn't even reference the whole fucking show. Um, uh, am, am I pronouncing this right? Koriki? Koriki. Yeah, Kariki. You know, it, my notes. Kariki. Uh, uh, I fucking love this band. You know, Thanks. fucking sound. Is is this is looking in the present towards the future? Is this a, a, a project that's moving forward still? Or like musically, uh, what does the future hold? Well, Joe and Amy and I. You know, Joe Lally from Fugazi. Yeah, I mean, basically, Amy and I played the evens we played till until 2013. Mm -hmm. Um. And then I kind of hit a wall with the two piece format because mm. I felt like, I mean, it's interesting. Like everything that I do, I really want to have, like, I'm trying to have like a moment with the audience and I, I really want things to be kind of relaxed and open, but the shows I found were feeling like recitals to me. Mm. And also because of my, history and people and i you know people are like oh we respect you so much which is nice but it meant that people were coming to see they're coming to see me or whatever they're coming to see the show and it was a bit more of an event whereas mm -hmm. i'm just trying to like say like hey let's make a show together that was my thing like let's make a show let's sing let's let's try to elevate this room take it get us out of here and uh 
Um, but it really turned into a, a, I felt it goes with a two piece. It's hard to like wander because you leave the other person in a lurch. Right. And so there was a conversation, musical conversation that I was missing. So then we thought, well, maybe we'll get a, we'll start playing with somebody. So we asked Joe if he wanted to play bass and we started playing with him in 2015 and we play for years, just practicing and really loving it. Um, having a good time writing songs. Eventually in, I think 2019, we did a couple of songs. Um, we did a couple of shows, sorry, a couple of shows. And then uh, we went back and practiced more and more. And, and then we actually did a series of what we call brunches. We would invite friends over and just do like to two or three people and give them a, a menu of the song titles. And we just practiced in front of public practice sort of. Um, and then we started doing shows and they were great. We did about, I think, six or seven shows. But the last of those shows was February 2020. And then mm. we recorded an album at that point. We recorded that in December of 2019. Um, and we had the record supposed to come out March uh, 20, March 26th, I think, was the date of the, which is, of course, COVID. Yeah. It was right when COVID locked down. In fact, we were just about to ship Ooh. the records. You know, we have to stagger the shipments. When you ship to the West Coast, you have to ship a couple weeks early to give them, get the records across the country. Um but so the stores and distributors have them in time. And it was, I remember it was March 16th and we were here at the office and we're like, I guess we better send these things right now. Cause I think the post office is going to shut down. Right. 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 So we the, it's, it's, the the, it's the Andromeda strain, right? Right. right. Yeah. And I thought, Oh shit. And then I remember it was a weekend and I said to Brian, who's the manager here, I said, Monday morning, we got to ship everything. We're not staggering. We're going to ship everything out and get it to the stores right away. And then that night, it was a Sunday night, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, wait a minute. Like if it, everything shuts down, yeah, those records are going to sit on a doorstep. Yeah. Exactly. Or if they get in, the shops may shut down and those records will just disappear. So I, just, I, let, I, I remember I wrote to Brian at like five in the morning. I said, we got to pull the plug on this. Right. We got to see what we got to see how this is going to play out. Um, and then people said, well, you know, you could just release it dig digitally. Yeah, we could have. But that's not fair to the shops. Yeah. So we said, nope, we're going to hold it. So we held it to the summer of 2020 until the shops actually had come up with um, their the way they were navigating the, the pandemic, which was they were a lot of them are doing like pickup orders or mail order and stuff. But we just waited until people figured out how to land and um, for that time. And the record came out and I was very happy with the way the record came out. Um, and we were practicing. We continued to practice for another um, year and a half or two years. But then at some point I just thought, oh, I'm out of ideas. So that's where we're at, you know. <laughs> It's, um, you uh, know, I'm out, but we'll see. Um, we, we, you know, we'll see. Sorry, someone just came in. We'll see what happens. You know, I think that you know we're all this stuff is possible. I mean, I, I mean, Joe, I'm in, I'm in touch with. Obviously, Joe lives around the corner, and I see Amy every day. We were married, there, so there so, go. and you know, and and it's always a possibility. Um, we did record some more songs, which we never put out. Um, uh. It's also complicated because I find a lot of the, um, I don't, the music, the way the, um, like I, I'm not into like so much of the underground music scene or what the music scene itself is now defined. Like it's, it's, it's the framework of it is, it's so weird to me. It's like managers and agents and publicity people. And it's just so not punk to me. And I, I'm looking for that scene that doesn't have that world. Like, I don't want to deal with those things. But the problem is, is that if I play a show, like when we played our first show, Amy and Joe and I, we announced it a week ahead of time. Yeah, I remember we said, that. Yeah. Ian, Joe and Amy are inviting you to a public practice. Right. And it got picked up by websites. And we had 500 people there. Didn't so, is, 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 didn't something like that happen in Brooklyn? Did it happen in Brooklyn? Was that or was that no, down there? there? It was didn't down there? here. Okay. It was down yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, we never made it to New York, but the okay. um, sorry. So the so the point being is that I'm in a weird. I'm straddling a weird. It's a weird situation. I don't really want to deal with larger venues because they're the machinery around them. Sure. Um, but I can't. It's hard for me to play small venues because 
people come out. So it's just a weird, it's not, I'm not complaining. It's just, right. it's just, but here's the thing. Like it's always about creative response. That's my thing. Like I look at situations, you know, I, I once read a quote, I don't know who said it and maybe somebody in your viewership knows, but it was, it said, you know, you paint yourself into a corner and then you paint your way out. Mm. So that's where I'm at. You know, we'll see what happens. I'm in no hurry. It, I'm, it, a patient, I'm a patient boy. It's it, it's all reciprocal. It, it, the wave goes in and the wave goes out, right? It right. It, it it happens in waves. So, so that said, um, anybody you want to thank on the way out? Anybody you anybody you want to shout out? Thank on the way out. Well, thanks for your patience, Drew. I know um, you've been bugging me about this for quite a while, and I'm <laughs> slow to. I don't I don't do a lot of podcasts, um, um, but I do them occasionally, and. Uh, and thanks. I don't know how many people look at this thing. Thanks for looking at it, people. Um, thanks to Glenn for making an appearance. I was nice to see him. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, I've always been a part of something. Like I, that's my thing. I've all, you know, like I wasn't. It was, you know, like I was part of Team Sahara. I was part of the Teen Idols and Meyer Threat and Discord Records and Fugazi and all these. I'm always. I'm a part of something. So obviously. I'm not here on my own volition. Um, I'm here as a part of the efforts of many people. Yeah. And to all of them, I owe a great deal of gratitude. Thank you, Ian. Let's keep in touch. Nice to see you. See nice you again. To see you. I'll talk to you soon, man. I know. Take care. Whew. Well, there you have it. Today's guest was Ian Mackay uh, from Minor Threat, Fagazi, and so much more. Uh, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and thank you all so much for stopping by. It was uh, it was a really great show today, uh, a show that meant a lot to me personally. So uh, I really I really appreciate it, and I want to thank everybody that has that has supported me. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a real DIY uh, effort here. You know, um, you know, for those of you that might be uh, tuning in uh, to the show for the first time and enjoyed it. Uh, I just want to let you know there is a uh, there's a Patreon page if you want to support the page if you want to support the show, uh, join Patreon. There's some uh, exclusive content and uh, just uh, be an insider on what's happening. This show this show happens because of your support and you enabling it, so to speak. So I'm very very fortunate, and and I know that, and I appreciate it very much. Um, thank you, everybody from around the world. Uh, hey. Hey, Biv, I, I hope you're well. Uh, it was so nice to see so many of our old friends chiming in and, 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 and tuning in. Uh, it meant a lot. This was, this, like I said, <laughs> this was a big one. Oh, I just want to mention that uh, a couple of the uh, upcoming, upcoming shows, uh, I didn't even mention what's coming up. Um, coming up, here we go. Coming up uh, this Sunday, Allison Brown, the photographer. Will be on, and we are we are excited. We are excited about that. Uh, a week after that, Vic DeCara from 108 and uh, and uh, beyond, and Shelter Ryan Packer speak about Boston on Wednesday, February 21st. Dana Crystal, we'll be talking about CBGB's 50th anniversary, uh, is coming up on February 25th. Sunday, March 3rd, is Drew Thomas from Bold. And crippled youth, Adam Voss from Conservative Military Image, where you're going to be announcing this show tomorrow. Wednesday, March 24th, Mike Score from All Out War, Phil Pulio from Cop Shoot Cop and Swans on March 31st, Bob Japardi, Concrete Marketing on April 3rd, and John Connolly from Nuclear Assault on April 14th. So all that, all that is going down. Uh, your uh, you're welcome to you're welcome to come by. Uh, everybody else, um, yeah, Adam Voss, who wants it? Yeah, right. Good, good. To, hey, Jamie. Uh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, Jamie. I should mention that Jamie from SSD. Um, Want to mention we have um, a gig. We're coming up. Uh, Jamie from SSD's new band, The Long Wait, featuring ex-members of Slapshot, SSD Control, Wrecking Crew, are going to be talk about playing all ages free live show here in New York City on Sunday, February 18th. Non-residents, incendiary device. It's going to jump off tonight. 
the long wait, crazy Eddie, and neck scars. And by the way, I'm going to be up in Albany with Biohazard on March 2nd. They're playing with brick by brick, concrete ties, violent by design, and torn out. We're going out to the West Coast, incendiary device that is. We're playing with our friends in Channel 3 on at the Kensington in San Diego on March 9th. And on Sunday, March 10th, the Sardine in San Pedro. Yo, come see us play. We're coming out west. Make it happen. Um, I am moderating the Ray Capo book event from Punk to Monk at Generation Records on Sunday, April 7th. This is going to be great. And a couple days later, I am up at Bridge Nine Records in Beverly, Mass, moderating the Ray Capo book event. Back at the Barry Electric on Sunday, April 21st, all ages free Sunday matinee with Fahrenheit 451, Kings Never Die, Brick by Brick, the Car Bomb Parade, and Faded Line. And then, of course, back in our beloved, beloved Tompkins Square Park Memorial Day, our annual Memorial Day weekend show, Saturday, May 25th, Rebel Matic, Incendiary Device, Non-Residence Cartel, Guitar Me of One, and then Rampage Fest 6 with Adrenaline OD headlining is Sunday, June 2nd. That's right. You have been watching and enjoying and supporting the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. And of course, we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, VTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Mad Vintage. So there you have it. Thanks a lot, everybody. It was a great show. I couldn't do it without you. This one was really special to me. We've... we've We've reached, we've really reached the mountaintop here. You know, it's been a couple of years. Um, it, it's, it's. Uh, what can I say? I'm, I'm, I'm all choked up. <laughs> I'm all choked up. You know, this, this was a big one. This was a big one. And, uh, you know, the only thing I can really say in the end is, please do good things, and good things will come to you. <laughs>